And so we'll start, uh, as we always do, with public comment. Is there anyone here for public comment? Not related to something on the agenda, generally. So um, if there's not anyone here for public comment, then we'll move on to our agenda. And yes. No, 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 just about topics not on the agenda itself. So we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so we have a few things under our licenses, public way and metered parking reservations is a general section of our uh, agenda. And I think we have uh, folks here for, for, uh, for that. So I think we'll start with um, the folks that are here for Halloween Fest. That would be you. All right, great, thank you. Um, so just tell us about the event a little bit and you know, if you wanna mention, so start by your name and, and who you're with and then if you wanna guide us through uh, your event and tell the town about that a little bit and then uh, we'll talk about what we need to do thank you um, relative to the, the reservation space so awesome so good evening I am Stacy Laqui from Amherst Leisure Services um, and I am here to request the North Common parking lot and the North Common and um, Pleasant Street um, from the North Common to Kellogg Street for our annual Halloween Fest. And this year is our 50th year. So we've made it to 50. It's gonna be um, a fabulous event. I expect, last year we had between two and 400. I think it was 400 by the time the, the parade actually hit the Bang Center. Um, it's a great event for families, little ones. We all get dressed up. I am, uh, I have been the witch for the past 10 plus years, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> right. The good witch. Right, so, well, something like that. Um, I, I do that just to be recognizable so that people understand where we're going and where we're doing. We meet at the North Common, we'll have some sort of little event. Uh, we're kind of in the planning stages, either pumpkin roll or pumpkin decorating. We'll meet there. Amherst Police has always been great about meeting us out there, stopping traffic, kind of guiding us down and um, bringing us to the Bang Center. I've had uh, some non-formal or informal conversations and they are more than willing to help us out again and, and be the back, uh, front and back of our parades. So it will be happening on Sunday the 28th, weather permitting. Uh, we did have that one year <laughs> where it snowed. Um, so we're all gonna cross our fingers that that doesn't happen again. Uh, but it's Sunday, October 28th. Um, starts trick-or-treating with the businesses will start at noon but for our purposes tonight uh, we meet at about one o'clock on the North Common parking lot to start our parade any questions thank you are there questions if not then I'll entertain a motion for the reservation that we need which I think is on our new motion sheet as well as our old one as well I think it's under B it's under B 7B I move to approve the metered parking reservation of the Main Street parking lot on October 28, 2018 from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. for the leisure services and supplemental education's Halloween pumpkin decorating. Stacy Lecure, program director. That's Is me. Second? Is there a second? Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much. I Enjoy hope to see event. you guys there. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so next up, um, we have uh, a request for parking meter reservations on North Pleasant Street and Boldwood Avenue uh, for the Valley Kid Fest on September 29th. So if you'd like to come up and introduce yourself and tell us about your event and sure. sort of your need and yeah. we'll go from there. Um, so my name is Maura Roberts. Um, I work at UMass, um, representing the Office of Student Parent Programs. And so this is an event that we do in collaboration with Valley Kids. Um, it was formerly known as the Apple Harvest Festival, and now we are the Valley Kids Festival and Craft Fair. Um, and so this involves, there's crafts, there's things for people to purchase. We have performances that are free for people to come to. Um, and then we also do little games and petting zoos and things, which we um, charge for and all proceeds go to the Amherst Family Center um, and so this is happening on September 29th from 10 to 4 and so we were hoping to get the meters bagged on Boltwood and North Pleasant so that our vendors can um, unload and then load up okay. Great. thank you 
So do we have, I'm looking at the motion. You don't have specific times on the motion. Right, I'm looking for that too. And do we have a specific, I presume you need them for the whole day? Yes, yeah. All right, so um, be the time. People will start coming at eight to unload. Right. And then. Okay, so it's narrowed to the town common. It's the entire town common perimeter? That it would seem. It seems unlikely. Well, and then what about Spring Street, which is inclusive of that? <laughs> so. so it's on the part of the town common across from the Lord Jeff, so I believe it's a south town common. So it would be uh, Boltwood between College and Spring, and then it would be North Pleasant between College and Spring. And that's actually South Pleasant Street. I'm confused. Yes. So, so this is not your fault. We're, talk, we're trying to figure that's out fine. our paperwork here yeah. at this end. And so we don't actually have a letter in here anywhere from them that says what they wanted. We only have a motion. I'm confused Flyer, by that. Yeah. We usually have a map. Mm -hmm. We usually have a letter that says we want the same thing we got last year. And perhaps since we don't seem to have any of those things for some reason, maybe we could, we could ask them to ask, right? But we could also ask them if there are any changes versus last year if she happens to know, depending on. I do know. Great. Yes. Sorry. So we are running this this year. It was a previous person before. Um, but it'll look exactly like it has every other year. So we would like the same thing as previous years. Um. So I would suggest that we allow us, because we have you meet on Monday. Right. There's plenty of time. You could bring a, a motion with a map and everything for your action on Monday. Okay. Why don't we do that? Yeah. We're, try, we're trying to make it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what were the hours of the event itself? It's when? 10 to 4. Um, I think that uh, my concern is that if the event ends at four, what time could the parking be yielded? Because um, there are people who go in, uh, to Amherst Cinema on Sunday night and look mm -hmm. for parking, and I don't want to tie up spaces longer than necessary. Right. Yeah, we could. It could definitely just between eight be eight and five because we just need four to five to let people unload if possible. Or to reload. Right. So I think, though, what, what we need to do is to sort out the specifics for our motion. Okay. Not your fault, more our fault, to sort of nail down the particular meters and, and streets. Because it sounds as though you don't need the entirety of the envelope of the, the common, but just the southern part where the green space is, not the trees mm -hmm. part. Right, yes. So we'll have to figure that out, whether Spring Street's involved or not. So, so we'll look at what we did last year, and yes. okay. we'd be fine be with that if they did the yes. same thing last year. Yeah, that would be perfect. Year. Okay, we'll bring that yeah. back to the board on Monday, and they okay. and hopefully they'll. There doesn't seem to be a lot of opposition as long as it's the same. Okay. Is that okay? Okay. So thank you, and I hope everybody can attend on the 29th. Yes. Before. I appreciate what you said about about figuring out what we did last year, and hopefully we did. <laughs> hopefully we didn't make this mistake last year. <laughs> oh, we might. Have. Uh, sometimes we <laughs> repeat. But the other thing, if we when we are revising the motion to show the specific parking space, you know, the X amount of parking spaces on X roads or whatever, if we could also indicate that this does benefit the Amherst Family Center, since Valley Kids Fest is not like saying. You know, Ruger's or something that we all know what that is. Oh, because it's, it's, it's a benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it just any time we're doing a thing, it seems like we should show who it's for, like we do for Big Brothers Big Sisters, for example. Thank you. So next, we'll take on the. Uh, we have a. <clears throat> excuse me. We have a um, a common victual license for North Hot Pot. 20 Belchtown Road, and so if you folks will join us and tell us a little bit about your, your place of business, feel free to move a chair up. Introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit of, uh, about your business, and, uh, and then we'll take up the, the, uh, the license itself. Okay. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming, and thanks for listening. This is Jeremy. Uh, my Chinese name is Jerry Liu, so it shows on the paper. So my English name is Jeremy. This is my partner, Jian Huang Jason. So 
Uh, it's kind of interesting. Like uh, I just graduated from UMass Amherst two months ago, so I really love this town. So that's why we start to open a restaurant here to contribute more. And then, after a few months, we find a good place in the Twenty Belcher Town Road, Michael Spillers Bar. So we take over their business and try to open a hot pot. Uh, hot pot is kind of new stuff here, uh, but it's very popular in the Boston, New York, uh, almost. Almost many places in America, so we want to bring this fresh restaurant to Amherst because we have many international students here and we have many local students here. So in this case, I think more and more people love the hot pot. So what w the hot pot it is is like we gone off the raw food, the meat, and the vegetable to customers and bring the soup to the, all the customers and the customers. We will put the raw food into the soup. We have the induction, so induction can hit the soup. Make sure all the foods will be wrapped. Um, for the meat, we gonna cut it pretty thin slice. So in this case, as long as the temperature is enough, at least 15 seconds, the meat will be 100% safe. And for the vegetable, we gonna put the guidelines in the menu to make sure everybody can cook it around two minutes, at least two minutes, to make sure everything is pretty good and safe. And then we have, yeah, we have enough parking lot space. We have around 42 parking spaces and including the handicapped. Um, yeah, and that is uh, located in the big crossing. So I think, uh, what about the, whatever the traffic or something, I think, uh, our restaurant gonna handle that. So, yeah. Uh, any questions? We are happy to hear. Thanks. <laughs> questions, Ms. Brewer. So, for our own benefit, the uh, motion once again says Amherst, and since we don't approve uh, common fix for things that aren't in Amherst, I just as soon leave that out. I do appreciate <coughs> the street address. Um, a question I actually have for the town manager, perhaps more so than. Um, the applicants is we do have a restaurant in town that has hot pot tables installed and there was a large uh, bit of confusion about that when they were first installed and they weren't able to use them at first there were there were very specific codes that were involved and apparent one story which may not be true but one story was that maybe they bought them one place that didn't meet another place's standards, et cetera. And so I don't actually believe they've ever been put into use in that particular restaurant. The restaurant has been open, which is under different management now next to Miss Saigon. But the um, just in terms of the confusion, I know that because they had a restaurant in a different town, maybe different rules, and maybe they had the tables a lot longer ago, et cetera. So are we going to have difficulties with that this time out, is what I'm wondering, because we tried this and it got difficult. Right, thank you. The, the um, fire department, I believe, has already raised the issue in terms mm -hmm. of whether the, the equipment they want to purchase would yes. be acceptable in terms of our codes, electrical codes and fire department codes. So I believe they've already, they're, I'm told that they've had that, they're in that conversation with you about what kind of equipment you'll put on, as the hot pot on the table. Yeah, I got you. So all the equipment is from the China, and we're going to deliver all the equipment on the boat, uh, by the boat. And in this case, the town already have the conversation with us, so we talked to the manufacturer to take up, talk about the UL label mm -hmm. and the ETL document. So in this case, they told us like they really have the document, but it probably take a while for the process and give us the document to show up to you guys and, or town hall. So in this case, like uh, I promise, like we are not like kind of really, really stupid, like buy something is unsafe and really bad. We need to make sure like everything is pretty safe and good quality. So in this case, we trust our manufacturer, and they promise us they're gonna give us the document as quickly as possible. So in that case, we're gonna give, show the document to show all the equipment is has good quality and safe for sure. Yeah. So, so yeah. So the fire department says we need to see the UL right. certification, and yeah, yeah. they don't have that yet. Yes. But they are aware that that's a, a requirement before you can open and or before you can use these tables. Definitely. Yeah, we also want to make a promise like um, we're going to show the other document to make sure the town hall know 
uh, won't worry about the safety or something, then we're gonna open that. We won't open that before we give you the document. a document. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to be sure that was clear because I know that was a confusion point in the previous uh, mm -hmm. restaurant okay. that tried to do that. So hopefully we can explain it even easier mm -hmm. than this time around. Is there one other thing yes. I think? Yes. So there is a liquor license uh, for Michael's Billiards at this location, but they are not seeking to acquire the liquor, liquor license. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Michael's Billiards still has that liquor license, but it, they're not seeking a renewal of it either. So this, the, this, these gentlemen will not be coming to you, as far as I know, um, unless you apply for a liquor license yeah. in the future. Yes. So the follow-up then, and it did take me a few minutes to realize when I was reading the packet over the weekend that this is for the Michael's Billiards mm -hmm. site because there's nothing there that indicates that other than the street address, is, as you indicated, they do have an active license right now. They're, they've indicated, it sounds like to you, that they are not planning to renew. Are They are not currently in operation no. so it's a s form of pocket license but it's for a relatively short period of time right. and it's not preventing someone else from obtaining a license Correct. at this point it's not holding on to something that's a resource that others are therefore unable to apply for so it'll just wind its time out and okay mm -hmm. thank you that's helpful other questions from the board if not i would if Entertain a motion, or if you have a comment or question. Yeah, this is a motion. Okay. Um, I, have, I think every. I don't think with one word eliminated. I think we made a lot of changes. Uh, I move to approve the common victualler license for C H N Northern J and J Corporation doing business as North Hot Pot Twenty Belcher Town Road, Monday to Sunday, 11 a.m. to 12 a.m. the following day. Jaru Lu, manager. Is there a second? Second. So we have a, <laughs> we, have a, we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that's unanimous. Wish you very best of luck in your restaurant. Oh, in thanks your restaurant. very much. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, we are pretty nervous, but uh, <laughs> thanks. You guys are really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay. Thanks. All right. Great. Thank you. So just to touch base on our agenda a little bit, we do have a public hearing at 710, so we won't start that early, but we do have other things to, to take up. We'll get to our consent calendar later. Um, so I think we'll hopefully be able to do our fourth quarter year-end budget update. Is that possible for that to happen in 15 mm -hmm. minutes? I presume it is, since there's no, to my knowledge, no uh, surprises. <laughs> so if you want to come forward and, and, uh, and give us your report relative to the budget, please. That would be great. Good evening. I'm Sonia Aldrich, the Comptroller, and I'm here to present the fourth quarter in the fiscal year ending report for fiscal year 18 ending June 30th, 2018. Um, our general fund generated an operating surplus of 1,567.89 against a budget of 79.9 million. Fisc and this is this is great considering we had such a difficult year in fiscal year 18 with our health insurance deficit that we covered within our existing operating budget. Caught me off guard a little too soon here. <laughs> Um, everything is spelled out here with the revenues that came in and the expenditures that came in, so I'm just going to go through s some highlights, some of them, um, the ones that stand out the most. Fines and forfeits. Actual revenue was 130% collected, and this is due to zoning violations at the presidential apartments that were collected this year, so this is a one-time source of revenue, and it won't occur again next year, hopefully. Um, Investment income is at 145%, and this is mostly due to CD investment timing or when they mature. We still budget very conservative in this um, revenue stream. Miscellaneous non-recurring, the actual receipts here are 106%, and I know there was a request to have a little more detail on this. This is where we um, 
book the UMass funds received for the strategic partner partnership program that we have agreement that we have and um, Amherst College contributions that come to the town. So Amherst College, we received $80,000 this year. The UMass Strategic Partnership is $120,000. $120, and then we also received $163,241 from UMass in lieu of hotel motel taxes. Um, and then there was about 7000 7, in miscellaneous income there as well. Other departmental rent, departmental receipts were at 160% collected this year, or 163,000 in excess. And the bulk of this is um, increased fees for the planning board that's in that category. Um, and prior year refunds, and increased fire permits. Prior year refunds was um, 69,000, 58,500 of that was a reimbursement for Wildwood debt, MSBA, it's timing. Because it didn't come in on time, it becomes a prior year refund. So that's what's there. Um, penalties and interest at 176%. This is due to um, large tax liens collected in this fiscal year. The revenues that were below um, for licenses and permits. This has been trending down as the large construction projects have been trending down. So our budget hasn't been adjusted. Property tax and state aid are as they should be. On the expenditure side, um, surplus funds return were $291,981, and that's a really small amount compared to an $80 million budget. And again, this is due to us covering our health insurance, increase in health insurance for fiscal year 18 within our operating budget. The select board town manager budget was overspent by $20,000. And this is a large, this is due to the assistant to the town manager retiring and to, uh, for the payouts for that and then some charter commission expenses. And it's here, we do account for that separately. We have separate accounts for that so we can um, definitely say what was spent out of the charter. It just grouped in here with the town manager but that's the way you miss wants it grouped in with the select board town manager operating section. And I can give you more details on what was spent in the charter if you want after I'm done here. Public safety turned back $60,000 amongst all, all the entities. Um, public works turned back $8,000. Savings in street lights and equipment maintenance covered the overages in the other areas of that, of the division, other divisions of that functional area. Planning conservation and inspections th turned back 13,000 and community service turned back only 10,000. However, at the um, annual town meeting, we moved 125,000 from community services to general government to cover some of the health insurance um, overages. So it, it really was over $100,000 return there and the bulk of that was from uh, veterans benefits. We've, we paid out less this year and um, leisure services. The reorganization of leisure services saved us quite a bit of money this year. Um, schools turned back 25 cents. Again, they were dealing with the health insurance deficit too. Um, enterprise funds all returned, all, all returned funds to the, um, for free cash to increase their free cash except for sewer. We had lower, cons lower consumption from fiscal year 17 to 18 water consumption and this is basically due to having so much rain that we weren't, they weren't, we weren't watering gardens or lawns during the summer <coughs> months. And um, Paul mentioned this morning to me that with the, when the colleges are were under construction, they use a lot of water in that construction, so it was probably um, higher last year than it was this year, so. And that's pretty much it. 
Are there questions? Comments? There's one, and that is on the um, revenue side under property taxes. The um, amount that was budgeted and the amount received the actual revenue difference was about $750,000. Was that due to new growth or in things coming online? Or? It's collections from prior years, taxes. Because our collection rate for fiscal year 18 taxes was 99.5%, so we collected quite did really well in our collections for this year, but then there were other prior years that we collected. 2017, we collected um, 646, which is not part of what that is budgeted. Okay, so the new developments that came online was already built into the estimates to begin with? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So I had a couple, and I appreciate um, the breakout on the Amherst College and UMass funds because it's important to recognize the separation there, and hopefully someday we can find a way to continue to do that. I realize that Munis is what you have to work with, but it doesn't make any sense to me, and it doesn't need to. I just need the words that you put in the explanations. Um, the, it's also important because you, Amherst College, for example, donates that $80,000, but Amherst College doesn't pay anything for fire service, whereas UMass does that 120 and that and then also pays for fire service as part of the strategic partnership agreement. So it, sometimes people make assumptions about you know where all that money is and there are different ways of accounting for those different contributions that they make. Um, I did, I had asked also about the lower consumption and so we're basing it, so I was wondering you know where did the drought feed into this and, and all the other things, so we're saying it's lower construction use on the campuses they needed more before mm -hmm. so so it's a common it's a combination it's um, when they're building the big science center specifically they have to water the concrete constantly so that's that's a big piece of it but also it, we just use less water in general as a, as a community so it was both of those pieces together we had an inordinately high use high demand the prior year and we had a, a lower demand both through construction and through uh, weather related. And this summer will probably be a lower um, usage as well because this summer was fairly wet. And, and the sewer is based, the, the sewer that you pay is based right. on the water that Correct. you use, so. Right, and I was trying to, I mean, if we were gonna take it as a win because we did new conservation measures, great. But if it's also just because we had an unusual year, now we're back more to a normal year, then yeah. that makes well, perfect yeah. sense. And then the, I would like to, it doesn't have to be at this meeting, but I would like to have us have a reference document on the Charter Commission expenses. Sure, so we can give you a, a report. I mean, we have a spreadsheet, but it's, I think we can make it a little more understandable for you so you can see where the category, the big categories were to the Collins Center, yeah. um, which was the bulk of the money, um, to KP Law, which did work on reviewing the charter. We separated that out. Uh, for printing the charter booklet, which was about five thousand um, dollars, and for the mailing, uh, for the, those, were, and then they there was some costs incurred in terms of people who were videotaping or their meetings and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, but we can break that out in categories for you, so you can see where where the money came from. And so they, I think the total uh, was forty five thousand dollars that we we spent, and. Um, you know, I, I felt it was important for the legal advice to be given to the charter. So it was more than the appropriation plus the $5,000. And so that I authorized that to come out of the town manager's budget as well because it's, it's, we needed to get it right and we needed to, and they needed to get the legal advice to make sure it was right, done right. And, and I'm in no way disputing yep. that those were the appropriate charges. I just think it would be useful because there was a lot of talk about how incredibly expensive. Yep. And, of course, it has been incredibly expensive associated with people's time working on many, many things that you don't get to charge against yep. that account. But in terms of the very specific things like mm -hmm. postage and printing and additional legal help, I think it's worth being yep. able to show that we'll accounting. That. So thank you. 
are there other questions or comments relative to the fourth quarter? When, um, since someone threw their hand up right away, I'll ask this question. Um, so you're in the process of submitting the final numbers to the state and getting free cash certified and all that. What, what's sort of your expectation about when those will be sort of tidied up with the state? What do they usually do as far um, as when they're? We're actually, the town's collected all the um, outstanding grant receivables that are coming in. We're waiting for a couple for the school and as soon as they do, it's all set to go to be sent in. So it could be as early as next week or <clears throat> it might take um, two or three more weeks before I submit, depending on the receipt. If we don't receive those, it hits our free cash. Right. Right. Ms. Kruger. So I don't know if I really probably open this can of worms, but um, it's nice to see that we came out so much ahead, which seems to be somewhat of a pattern. And I get that we budget in a conservative manner, and then we do better on revenue than expense. That's good. But um, some might say if we're so consistently over our estimates, why are we being so frugal on some of our lines? And so I think um, this sort of is this the right amount to be over? And how to, historically is this is this really where we're trending, or is this just a good year and offsets a sort of mm -hmm. potentially bad year? I. Th I, I feel that if you go back and, and do the comparisons from year to year, you'll find that the sources of money for excess money come from different places practically every year. And, some, and also, we can't forget the Medicare D reimbursement that comes in and goes into the general fund. It's not budgeted for, so it's part of that big number, and it, gets, comes, and it gets, comes out and goes into OPEB. So there's a lot of um, moving pieces there. So I, so I wouldn't cool. say that this can be counted on every year it, it's I'd, I'd like to add to that it, it's not like magic and just you know <laughs> we, we bulk up all the numbers you know, there's active management of all the budgets and the comptroller Ms. Aldrich works very hard and identifies um, weaknesses in people's budgets very early in the fiscal year um, fire department was was one example this year that um, she brought down the hammer and really had them really looking at all their expenses for the rest of the year so that they came out in the in the black. It wasn't just, oh, well, that happened. There was active management of all of our budgets um, coming from the comptroller's office. So I think it's not just something that happens. It's, it's really terrific uh, active management of the budgets that makes it happen. Under, understood. It just, yeah. I think you've heard the <clears throat> comment on the other side. Yeah. I think the critical point that she made, though, with regard to that, is that those sources that create those excess, which is a really tiny percentage of the of the whole budget, quite frankly, are always different. There's, so there's, it's not like it's always the same section of the budget that kind of gives us this chunk that we can call, you know, get turned into free cash. So I think because of that, it makes it, you know, it's not predictable. So it's nice that it has been coming out in our in our sort of favor in that regard, but um, it's not. If it was always the same section of, the, of our budget that always, you know, turned back $150,000, mm -hmm. then we need to budget that section of our budget differently. But that's not the case. And I do appreciate the active mm -hmm. management comment you made associated with that. It doesn't just happen because because we just build in big numbers and then it all works out great. So thank you for that. One other aspect, following up on something Mr. Slaughter said earlier about timing of free cash certification, et cetera. So one of the transition pieces we know is is a challenge is setting the tax rate because we usually do that right around the time of the swearing in of the counselors. So how are what's our timeline on that do we know at this point uh, the the assessor and the board of assessors have had that on our calendar for november 17th and 13th and they've got the ad ready to, everything's ready to go okay and they're they're ready to go they could go this week if we wanted to but we think awesome not quite this week but um <laughs> there's advertising requirements but, but we're prepared for that november 13th right. i think is, is that the date yeah, yeah. right Thank you so much. I, again, we're having to make all sorts of shifts in all parts of the buildings, not just this building. So right. I appreciate that. Right. Great. Thank you very much. Is there another comment? I don't think so. But thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yep. <clears throat> so it is actually 710, and we have a, a public hearing. 
uh, relative to an all alcohol license application for Jake's at the Mill, 68 Coles Road. Search for where is the manager? So if the gentleman would join us. Um, I do have to formally open this hearing, right? Mm -hmm. So I will formally open this hearing at, I'll get the iPad time for, <laughs> I can hit the button. 711 will be our official start of our public hearing. No to that. And so, um, we'll dig our paper out because there's plenty of that relative to this. Yeah. So give us just mm -hmm. a moment. Certainly, yeah. Section. So if you'd introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about uh, the addition to your offerings that you're seeking and uh, and then we'll ask some questions and we'll see if... Great. Uh, uh, my name is Christopher Ware. I'm one of the owners of Jake's at the Mill on Coles Road. And I'm Alex Washett. Uh, it's nice to be back and see you all again. Yeah, thank you. So our plan is to obtain a full liquor license uh, for our restaurant to be able to, to serve brunch style cocktails um, during the legal hours until three, when we close, 3 p.m. Uh, specifically, we're, we're just looking to do mimosas. Uh, so that would include champagne and juice and uh, Bloody Marys, which would consist of vodka and tomato juice and couturements. Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, training you're doing? Uh, yes. So um, licenses, you know, yeah, uh, ID yeah, checking, yeah. that sort of thing. So, Can you kind of walk um, us through what your process and procedures are going to be? our business in um, Northampton, uh, we have had a uh, beer and wine uh, license there for the last six years. Six years. Six years. Mm -hmm. um, so we plan to do what we have done there, uh, get all of our staff officially tips trained. Um, we uh, plan to have uh, software in order to, to uh, check IDs as well. Um, and that's kind of kind of the specifics of those. Right. Um, yeah. And then infrastructure wise, um, we have, you know, lockable uh, equipment to store the alcohol. Um, and really, um, because we're just looking to do it in a very small capacity, um, once again, just mimosas and Bloody Marys, um, you know, our inventory is extremely low um, and very easy to keep track of. And a lot of our current staff there has a, uh, experience bartending and with um, alcohol sales. Right, as does our, well. our front house manager, um, yeah. specifically in Amherst, um, comes from a you know, decade plus of specific bartending experience. Um, knowledge of the, um, the uh, a few different s systems that we're looking at to uh, implement, uh, software systems that we're looking at, um, and, and, it's, and, uh, and TIP certified as well. Yeah. Thank you. Does the board have questions? So, um, of course, we always like seeing that there have been no prior disciplinary actions, and so I appreciate you sharing your experience with Northampton. And full disclosure, I've been to their restaurant many times in both locations, especially this one, and um, was, in fact, just wondering the other day, hey, when are we going to be seeing this application? And here we uh -huh. go. Yeah, yeah. So, because you had indicated to us back when you did the Common Vic that you'd be going down this road. You mentioned that you've been doing beer and wine in Northampton. I know Northampton has a shortage of licenses, and so that's yeah. certainly part of that. You also mentioned mimosas and Bloody Marys here, but this being an all-alcohol license, there's nothing stopping you from the next day deciding that you want to have beer and wine. And so while that might be your current business plan, it's that we understand that we can't limit them to that. And so um, that is part of the nature of the public hearing, I suppose, because there, I suppose it's possible that some people would look at those things differently, but again, it is a breakfast and lunch place. It is not a late night place. And were the hours to want to be extended because someday you just have to be open all the time, then they would come back for extended hours But the, because this alcohol service would be limited to these hours, even though it would be all alcohol, even though they don't intend to use fully all aspects of the all alcohol license. Does that make sense? Is that how we're understanding it? Yeah, all alcohol means they can serve anything. Right, but, the, but they can't, 
while they can choose to serve any kinds of alcohol beyond what they're talking about today, they cannot choose to serve past 3 p.m. if they decide to start keeping right. the restaurant open later than that because we are approving an alcohol license that ends at 3 p.m. Right. Your motion will reflect what hours they're allowed to operate. That's what I wanted to be clear on. Um, just a, a follow-up, because I was thinking, you know, once we grant it, it's then all alcohol, and it's nice to know what your thinking is, but, mm -hmm. but we're not limited. We couldn't and shouldn't limit you to the mimosa primary right. thing. Right. But <clears throat> I think you had mentioned <clears throat> last time you were here about thinking about possibly doing some special events like, you know, a Sunday night, I'm making this one up, but like a Sunday night gathering. So if you were to have alcohol for that, you would come in for a one day license or how would that work? They, right now they couldn't, do, you couldn't use your alcohol license say after three o'clock, but you had an evening event. In order to um, provide alcohol for that special event, what would they, what would they need to do to make that legal? Exactly. According to the law, you can't get have a one-day license if you already have a licensed premises. So that would not be an option. Well, and, I mean, and as, I mean, as you know, I mean, no business is a set structure. And certainly this is our, our, this is our, our focus right now um, from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. That's mm -hmm. the hours of operation. we be running for seven years now. Um, but certainly if, if the plan isn't working and we do have to you know, adjust our business model. Um, definitely some, some clarification as to, you know, that process going forward. Um, if we do have to make those adjustments, if we do have to do different hours or expand, expand hours, or we do have to start doing on-site catering at some point to supplement the increase in X, Y, and Z, you know, where, where would, what would the necessary steps have to be taken then? I mean, that's really kind of more of a question. And, you know, I mean, we are aware that's, but mm -hmm. want to make sure that everyone's aware of that, that we can. Yes. Right. Yeah. We right. knew you knew. Yes. <laughs> so, so once you figure out what you want, then you can come back to the board uh, for the town and say, we want to adjust our common victualler and our alcohol gotcha. alcoholic yeah. beverage license right. to oh, reflect these hours. Permit. It'll be a similar process. Right. Okay, great. And, and special permit, but not us. Yeah, it depends on what the special permit says. Okay, sure. Okay. Gotcha. Sure. Mr. Steinberg. Uh, Northampton restaurant right now, if I recall, has uh, mimosas and beer available. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we currently have a beer and wine, uh, year round beer and wine license. Um, and we're not restricted on um, any specific time frame there in Northampton. It's, it's, it's open. Yeah. Champagne's a wine. So champagne so is, champagne's a wine. is a wine. So that's, yeah. 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 So the uh, thing that you would offer additional here would be uh, the Bloody Marys, which would you could not offer there. Correct. Yep. Correct. That's right. Um, and there might be other similar kinds of drinks that you find are appropriate for service during breakfast and lunch in those hours. And of course, you have the freedom yes, to do certainly. that. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. It, it could. You know, the the offerings within the context of the you know brunch um, beverages could expand. Um, you know, maybe we want to use a, a, a sake. Uh, you know, rice wine. Yep. You know, like just a different flavor and go in that direction. But the, the general, um, you know, the scope of the brunch cocktails, you know, that's just what we do, you know, seven to three. So that wouldn't change. We have no plans of changing that. That's, you know, the model that we're working on right now. We can, we'll plan to, to work on. Okay. Now I have a traditional thing that I usually end up <laughs> be being the one to do my board my fellow board members would be um, unhappy if I didn't say this um, being a college university community um, underage drinking is a problem um, I was very pleased to hear the training and systems that you've proposed because that um, really helps to address it your experience at running this kind of an enterprise. The fact that Northampton has some of the same population, not quite the same percentage, however, mm -hmm. as Amherst does. Uh, this gives you some experience at it. Uh, we just caution all license um, holders to be aware uh, that this is a uh, problem of great concern 
to this community. Uh, we believe that uh, responsible alcohol use is a very important part of the business community. And, uh, uh, but we also recognize that we look for cooperation and for our business community to work with us in our police department and um, our consortium with the university and college called the uh, uh, Campus and Community Coalition to assure <coughs> that um, uh, we don't create situations that lead to unhealthy use of alcohol or illegal use of alcohol. Um, and uh, a little bit less concerned because of your business hours that this is a problem, but I did want to at least make sure that you understood that this is a ongoing concern of this board. And I'm sure that when the new license commission takes over under the charter, that it will be no less of a concern to them. Yeah, we can, we can certainly appreciate that. <coughs> and we discussed this at length, having known the area and grew up here, that that was a serious concern for us and our business, which is why we chose to invest in a software-based um, foolproof kind of checking as opposed to simply a training with an ID book or so. Yeah, it's certainly, it's, it's not an issue we take lightly. Um, and we don't take lightly in Northampton. And, in, 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 you know, as you've mentioned, Northampton is much less of a, you know, concentration of, yeah. uh, so, you know, we're just really being serious about it. And we expect the same level of seriousness from all of our employees mm -hmm. um, going forward. And I appreciate that <clears throat> because the last piece that I sometimes say, but I don't think I need to because you just said it for me, is that um, these training programs, there's only good as the training programs, and uh, the, but it's the management and the oversight of management that really makes it happen. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate mm -hmm. the spirit with which you've approached this. So thank you. Thank you. So if there aren't further questions or I don't presume there's anybody from the audience that wants to offer public comment on this particular thing, yes. I was just going to say that actually one of the reasons we go into that level of detail, even when we know applicants have experience elsewhere and clearly haven't had any violations elsewhere, et cetera, is for the benefit of the public who might be attending for that purpose. But it, as you indicated, it doesn't appear anyone actually came for the but which is probably a good sign, right? They saw that and they said, <laughs> fine, no problem. But um, just so that the public be, understands. There's people from the public who may okay. want to comment. Good. Okay. So then if there do. are people that want to comment, this now's your chance. Uh, so just uh, step to the mic if you could, and if you guys yeah. could just oh, kind yeah. of make a little room, up. just introduce yourself at the mic, and, and sure. feel free to offer comment relative I, I to this. Have, my name is Gordon Green. I'm uh, a neighbor adjacent. Uh, I don't have any extensive comment. Um, just that I'm glad to hear that there is a time limit, and I hope that the, uh, the select board or whatever body We've used the hours of the uh, alcohol permit in the future. Keep in mind the noise level of the neighbors. Um, we're used to the harp, so that level of noise is um, is something good. But it's something that is, is I think something everybody's useful used to. But um, any sort of big deviations from that, I think, would be good to um, consider in future changes into the license. That's all I had. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. So is there any other public comment relative to that? If not, then I'll, uh, I'll close the hearing at 7.24. And so if someone would like to offer a motion, Ms. Um. I move to approve the annual all alcohol license application for Jake's at the mill, 68 Coles Lane, Coles Road, Monday through Saturday, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., Sunday, 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. Christopher Ware, director. Second. And there's a second. Is there further discussion? Is it 10 a.m. on Sundays? It was my understanding it was 10 a.m. on Sundays. Yeah is the Massachusetts law. Uh, but except it's not okay. because Mass <laughs> because Amherst has Sorry. never ex that Wait, Amherst has never accepted oh. that provision to start oh. at 10 a.m. on oh. Sundays. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and while other municipalities have and some other licensees may forget that um, on occasion, we have not at town meeting had to have accepted that provision and we have not. Right. 
It could know, happen in the future under the It council. absolutely could under the council. That would be something for the license commissioners to look at and right, perhaps right. bring to the council and say, let's do this. It's one of those on our to-do list things that has never gotten addressed. Well, thank you for clarifying. So we're, yes. we're sorry that that no, wasn't no, communicated no, effectively. Yes. Surprise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's completely fine. So is there any other I, discussion or I, comment? I, I can hear that? you like, like quivering. Yeah, over well, there. I was just. Wait a second. Okay. So Northampton's done it, but we haven't. Is right. The problem. Yes. 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 Right. So uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed. So that's unanimous. Congratulations. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Those are the better notices that yeah. you need. Yes. If you would give those to our clerk, if you would be so kind to hand those, Mr. Steinberg. Thank you very much. Great. We'll record those. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming. We filed away. All right, so it takes care of that. We move to the next spot in our agenda, which is notice of intent to convert use of Chapter 61 land, Epstein, 37 Bay Road. Mr. Zomek. Mr. Burgess. Thank you very much. Um, I'm joined by, by Mr. Burgess, um, and also in the audience tonight is the executive director of the Kestrel Trust, Kristen DeBoer. If the board has questions for Kristen later, I'm sure she'd be happy to come up and answer those. Um, I start a little bit with an apology. I was here last week uh, with what I had hoped to be the last uh, step in the acquisition process uh, of this wonderful project down in South Amherst that I know the board is very familiar with. But for those watching in the audience here tonight and at home, uh, if I could just tell those folks what we are doing, but through a, a, a state land grant and town meeting action, the town is proposing and is nearing completion uh, and headed toward closing to buy about 30 acres of land in South Amherst. Uh, we are partnering, if you will, with the Kestrel Land Trust, a longtime Amherst partner, uh, and the Kestrel Land Trust is, is buying the uh, land uh, outlined here, uh, which is about 3.4 acres. Um, late last week, uh, as attorneys got together toward moving toward the closing, working with Mr. Burgess uh, on some final details, uh, uh, collectively they realized that uh, a very small portion of the excluded land, if you will, was in Chapter 61. Uh, I know the board is very familiar with Chapter 61. Uh, I, I, I hope I am not becoming the king of Chapter 61. I, I don't want that title, but uh, here we are. And so we realized that um, the Balderwood Trust, which is the trust that is, um, was formed by the Epsteins and is selling the bulk of the land for, for conservation to the town of Amherst and the 3.4 acres and change to the Kestrel Trust, needed to notice the town that a very small portion of land um, was still in chapter. And in order to clean this all up, it was decided to notice the town and come before you tonight. I want to give an opportunity, if it's uh, OK with the chair, for Mr. Burgess to just say a little bit about that. Or, you know, Do you want to add anything to that in terms of your discussions with the attorneys? Sure. Uh, my discussions with the attorney was with Mr. Spencer, and his original intent was to simply release the piece of the land, uh, f file a le release on that piece of land. And after talking with me, uh, him and myself, we decided that it would be better to release the whole property because there are certain areas that cross over into each other. And there's actually an 8.3 acre exclusion on the original deed, or the original lien. And back when that was filed in 1981, we did not require anyone to split out the areas just to say that they were leaving 8.3 acres out where the house sits in the area around that. So to make it clean and make sure we had everything out, it was easier to release all the liens at one time. Uh, and that includes the 17,000 square feet that Mr. Zomak's talking about on the 61 land. So I just showed a context map, but I also wanted to provide the board and the viewing public with a, a more specific map um, zeroing in on the 3.4063 uh, acres that the Kestrel Trust will be acquiring and the, the uh, land in question relative to Chapter 61. So again, all of the 30 acres around the, the, um, 
the pond and uh, the exclusion will be acquired for conservation purposes and then this area will be acquired by the Kestrel Trust. And a very small portion of that uh, outlined here, this 17,000 square feet, is part of the reason we decided to bring this to you to simply clear this all up. Now I realize this is a little bit out of our normal practice. Um, this is the a &R approval not required plan that was reviewed by the planning board, reviewed by the planning director, the town engineer, the conservation commission, my staff and I, um, and I spoke with Christine Brestrup uh, uh, regarding whether, now your normal practice is to have a memo from the planning board and the conservation commission. In this case, I felt number one, we're moving very rapidly. Our hope is to close on this in a few days, but the planning board uh, has been involved, if you will, in this project. They, they understand what the outcomes will be. Likewise, the Conservation Commission has been around the table from the get-go. So this very small piece of land and this need to make sure that we clear up the title for this 3.4-acre uh, site really uh, was the genesis of why we brought it to you tonight. So my hope is that you would um, um, take the action to not exercise the town's right of first refusal since our goals have been clear from the, from the outset. Are there questions or comments from the board? <clears throat> oh, I think, so. <laughs> I think it's fairly straightforward, yes. I, I think this falls under, if you tell us about it often enough in enough different ways, we eventually say, okay, we're out of questions. Yeah, just do it. So I think we're, since we actually went over this quite a bit with the last couple of 61s we did, right? We're pretty familiar in the in general area. so. Anyway, so if, if there's not questions or comments for the uh, for Mr. Zomek or Mr. Burgess, then I think a motion would be in order if someone would like to make the motion Both. under section four of our motion. I don't have to be the reader of it, but I can. Um, I move that the select board not exercise the option to purchase granted to the town under Mass General Law Chapter 61 to purchase properties located at 37 Bay Road and contiguous plots as identified by the assessors as all or part parts of parcels 25B-19, 25B-20, 25B-21, and 25B-59 containing 3.4063 acres more or less a portion of the premises described in deeds recorded with the Hampshire Registry of Deeds in book Four one one six, page seven. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank I, you. Very I much. hope to not again. bring this project back <laughs> we'll to you again. To see it um, thank you. Thank you both. So I think we have some guests waiting for us. So I'm going to hijack our agenda a little bit and move to. Uh, the shade tree regulations, which are at the bottom of section four, which is F, because I don't, I don't think we have a lot of uh, discussion there necessarily, but nonetheless, I think we do have a fairly clear um, set of actions to take. So, do you want to? Uh, sure. Uh, I recognize that the tree warden is here, and he, he may join us. So. Um, at a previous meeting in July, you reviewed the shade tree uh, regulations, but they were uh, in a format that weren't that wasn't in compliance with the way we were developing um, our bylaws and regulations, which you will see more in, in more detail when the bylaw review committee comes to meet with you on Monday. So we um, we edited it slightly and put it in a different format to comply with the way. Um, the the, um, the bylaw review committee, for instance, we put the penalties and fees in a what they call a data block up front, and so everything is going. Everything you will see will be in a data block up front, so it's very clear what the penalties and fees right now. Penalties and fee, fees are sometimes incorporated into the bylaw, sometimes separate. So we want to be. We just wanted to provide some consistency. But typically, everything else was either part of the original bylaw that was proposed, and which we, which the board determined wasn't appropriate for the bylaw, but should be part of regulations, 
um, and or else it's it's in here as part of the regulations and we also followed the same numbering lettering convention that they use so that's really the only change that we made from previously so so I will say I know that some folks on the public shade tree uh, board have reached out to me I've not gotten back to anybody so uh, it's it's uh, I've been in this time of year is an extraordinarily busy time for me and I haven't called anyone back about anything including my mother who called <laughs> me about five times in the intervening weeks since uh, since we saw this but anyway nonetheless um, I wasn't uh, intentionally ignoring you just not having a an opportunity to get back to you on that and and so uh, and in some ways I didn't have much news until we saw this and and so we were waiting for this to be uh, sort of retrofitted into the shape it's in now. It, the content was fine, which was the content of our conversation the last time. So I think we'll probably take it without too much exception. Ms. Brewer, did you have something Several, to ask her? Several, actually. Um, right. So one question is more a matter of along the lines of what you explained about the formatting. So this is new to us and this looks nice and that's great. So how, what is the new philosophy associated with that in terms of how it's clear that there are regulations and there's a bylaw and that those things live together or are connected in some fashion? Because lots of bylaws don't have regulations mm -hmm. and some regulations don't have bylaws. <laughs> so how do people know there's both? And maybe that's something for the bylaw review uh, mm -hmm. committee yeah, to talk about. We did not identify that. Um, I mean, the, the bylaw allows for the regulations to be established, but if there's nothing in the bylaw, we'd have to change the bylaw to say there have been regulations established. I guess what I'm asking is more of a- Tie them together. Is how, you know, I'm not asking us to go back and fix yep. the bylaw because that's fine. Because there are plenty of bylaws, many, most of which don't have regulations associated with them. So I would just want that somebody who is looking at this, and this is this is more a matter of how we're going to file it, mm -hmm. right? So that when somebody's looking it up online or they're asking the office for it, they say, oh, well, I see the special town meeting action, but oh, there's regulations? I didn't know that. Or vice versa. Yeah, so I think the bylaw review committee has contemplated that. Yeah. They have... Um, as you can imagine, they've thought about this in a comprehensive way, and they want to put together one document, um, not even not a printed document, but an electronic document where you would hyperlink things, regulations, and you would nice. find things like that. Um, and they're formatting it so that it's re easily readable online, and they want to put together one thing that includes everything. So people say, what are the bylaws and the regulations of the town? You'd go to one site and find everything right. versus trying to hunting and pecking for them. Sounds really terrific. More specifically, mm -hmm. um, in terms of my notes from last time, I have a question here when we were talking about fines, and so this is now in that data block right up front. Mm -hmm. It said th we were working under the assumption of 300 because the bylaw says 300, and suddenly it still says 500 in that data block. Yeah, it's, it was just a... It, it's somebody's desire that keeps coming through well, the word processing well, without it actually being, as far as I know, the thing is, legal. When we were a town, 300 was, I believe, the limit. But now that we're a city, known as the town of Amherst, that limit may not apply. Now, whether or not, because the bylaw hasn't been changed, they may have to the adopt it. So that may set the upper limit just because it's in the bylaw. They have to amend the bylaw. Right. right. That was a. That was a. If it's, if it's legal, but I flagged that off. Okay. My understanding is that that was desired, but was never actually right. true. Okay. Right. So I think that that desire came through. So we should keep that at 300 to be in compliance. A good catch. Sure, yeah. yeah. Did you have more, Ms. Brewer? I actually had one that I hadn't found yet, and maybe somebody can point me at it now that it's. We. I know we we organized a good bit of this since the last time we talked about it on July 23rd. But I had a note about the Mass General Law associated with five inch DBH, but I don't actually remember. I think the goal was to move the definition of DBH yeah. earlier, which is the second thing into the definitions. Yep. But there and was also an, an inch requirement that which also I, was a little confusing at one point. And just like we didn't really go from 300 to 500, I just want to make sure we didn't really change something else there. It's probably driving Mr. Snow crazy to watch me struggle with this. But um, you want to keep looking for it at a couple. Yeah, I don't know where it is Find now. It. Yeah. If you would go right ahead. Um, it will be in front of those. Okay. I had I definitely saw the 500 instead of the 300 and uh, but um, right at the beginning cuz this uh, 
where it says uh, $90 per inch DBH right away. I had no idea what DBH is, so I know we have it right there in definitions, but where it appears above, it should say um, well, uh, diameter at breast height DBH, and then it'll appear again in the, because it's the common reader can't figure that one out. Um, and then um, this is just like uh, critical root zone also called, at the end of that paragraph or that definition, also called the root protection zone. I think the also, also called should be in the same sentence with the critical root zone. This is just, you know, I'm taking these in order, but not of order of importance. Um, and again, in definitions, the first time I see APSTC, I don't know what that is. I figured it out later. Um, oh, that was just one I missed. Uh, it's under gift tree fund. fund. Right. Meant to I've remove. Three definitions. Um, so, um, I just missed that one. But more of substance, what I had near the end on, um, what's the, well, we'll just say the last page. Um, F, hardship. Waiver reductions. If requested, the tree warden can consider financial hardship as a reason to waive or reduce the removal fee. This is an issue I had going back to when I sat on the planning board. If we're going to have a hardship waiver, I want to know what the criteria is. Um, I don't think any one person should decide, based on whatever, that that's a financial hardship for a person or a household. We need to have a standard, and we don't. And I raised this earlier when we reviewed this, and I still don't see it here, so I'm having trouble supporting this because um, it's great to have a hardship waiver, but I want to know what it's tied to. And um, I'm a little troubled in the next one. Three, appeals. Any resident or interested party may appeal these decisions. I want to know what the standing somebody needs to appeal. Like, I, I live across town, but I don't ever want a tree removed so I can appeal. I just, that's really broad. Um, I follow up on that one without doing Okay, but can I just, sure. oh, let me just finish, because then enforcement, the tree warden shall have the power to enforce these regulations and collect all fees and fines owed, but what happens to those fees and fines? So um, I, I'm assuming the way this is written that the tree warden has some police power to enforce this, because it refers to it earlier on. If that's not really where the police power is for enforcement, we need to think about how that happens. And then collecting fees and fines, um, we, we talked about this, so who actually tracks the money and what can it be used for? So um, it should just be consistent with the standards that we use for other things like this when we have non-criminal disposition. So that's what I found, and yes, uh, you, you had one on one of those. So my note said we changed it last time that under appeals, it said anyone may appeal these decisions. There was no definition of resident or interested party. My notes, it's crossed out and it says anyone may appeal these decisions. Um, whether that's true or interested, because that was a way of avoiding interested party. Is it an interested party from Northampton or is it an interested party from across town or is it somebody that's in a butter? I mean, either it's anybody in the world or those words have to, or words like resident or interested party need to be defined because interested party, that, that should not be subjective decision. So what, what do you want it to say? That's why I said anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly anyone. that didn't make I, it through. I look to sort of a more legal, you know, what, who is standing to an appeal, a, a, like a zoning a, a, um, decision or a planning decision, that kind of standing to appeal. Not just, I didn't like that you did that, I, I'm going to appeal. Well, I think right now it is anyone. Currently, it's right my now. belief, it is anyone. And so if we are either we want to keep it being anyone or we want to define who it would be, an interested party doesn't define that. I, I don't really care which way we go. I just don't want words that don't have meaning to be in here. I, I, don't, have, I don't have a solution. I just saw it as a problem. Yes. I'm more concerned about making sure there's a viable appeal process for the applicant. And that's what I think my earlier reading 
and you found your notes and I didn't look for mine, is about if somebody doesn't like the decision of the tree warden, what's the procedure in making sure that they have an appeal, in this case the appeals heard by town council. So, but this looks like anyone who doesn't like it, whether it's you know keeping the tree or not keeping the tree can intervene, which is currently true, which I think is potentially problematic. So I think the logic is that trees are a public resource and that even though you may live across town, you may walk past this tree every day and so you may have interest in this tree as part of the landscape. So I think that's the logic. It's not just a butters or a butters to a butters that might benefit from a tree. And just on the um, enforcement, this um, fits in, there, there is global language on enforcement that they have adopted, that the bylaw review committee has adopted in terms of where the money goes, who can collect the money, the collector can only take the money, things like that, that will supersede everything that, that goes for bylaws and things. So that they've sort of, and that's okay, why the, the, bylaw the bylaw review committee, yeah. So they've, they will, they don't, they didn't want to restate that in every bylaw that they reviewed. They just said, let's say, say that okay, up front. So that's and then it's going to flow through everything, yeah. But it's a, it's, a, it's a good question, yeah. Mr. Wall. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate Ms. Kruger's question about the hardship clause, but I mean, it, it, as far as I know, we don't define it anywhere, really. Uh, the example I'm familiar with, for example, is the local historic district, and the wording there is a certificate of hardship issued when the commission determines that disapproval of an application would cause substantial hardship, financial or otherwise. So it seemed to be a parallel thing that in one case you've got a commission in charge with administering a bylaw, in one case you've got the tree warden, and that's a responsible person who presumably understands the law and will make an informed decision. I mean, that may not be the satisfactory, but that's what I've seen in other aspects of our government. So I don't, is there any case for hardship is actually defined? That I, I'm not aware of it, I'm not saying there isn't, but. Have you had folks had this? Yeah, I, I'm not sure, but I know that um, <clears throat> I believe LSSC uses a, a standard to determine um, financial hardship. Financial hardship uh, for waivers. Um, I'm not sure if that's something we could use for this or not, um, but it's the only one I'm aware of. The reason I feel so strongly about this is that um, you're really making a decision about a particular household's ability to pay without having the background information to make that decision. You might say, well, there's two professors who live there, but you don't know that they're supporting. It's just, it's a, to me, it's a slippery slope and there should be an objective standard. I don't care so much what the standard is, but some kind of reference. We could tie it to what you know, CDBG uses or LSSC and pick something that's commonly used that's a cutoff, but I, um, I worry that without that, it becomes quite subjective. Well, we can see, search and see what other communities have done yeah. if they've allowed for hardship. And I brought it up before, but no, I, just I just missed it. Here. Yeah. Mr. Wall. Can we also just flag that then for the whole bylaw review process? I mean, Again. Can we flag that for the whole bylaw review well, process? Yeah, I think that I, I think it raises that specter across the board. I mean, Ms. Ms. Kruger mentioned. I mean, explicitly in, in other circumstances. direct their attention to that issue that's come up now. In right. A couple cases. Right. There was an appeal, by the way, too. I mean, but we, a case came before us involving a certain tree. Um, right. We've Co had a hearing here. A couple of years ago, so that part of the process we're familiar with, at least, even though it's not spelled out here in great detail. Yes. Um, I believe the. This particular um, appeal, number three here, uh, comes from Chapter 87, and it's relating to uh, when the tree warden has told an applicant they cannot remove the tree. Mm -hmm. Not that they can remove the tree, um, but you need to pay these, these uh, fines, fees. Um, hmm. So what is the appeal process when the tree warden says, no, you can't take down this tree to you know, fix your driveway? Um, what is the appeal process for that? And I think that's what this particular line refers Build to. Build council, please. The appeal process for someone who is requesting to take down a tree is already set. Mm -hmm. Going to the select board or to the charter. Um, yeah. so, so to belabor the appeal process just a little longer, um, as a, talking about who is allowed to do that, we talked about anyone and we argue about that a little bit, but when it says these decisions, 
which decisions, including the hardship waiver, uh, the decision to prune, the decision to pull out. I, I would argue we need some clarity as to which decisions can be appealed because this section refers to decisions in kind of a generic way that might make things more complicated than we really want it to be. Under requesting for the last page. Yeah, but it's number it's so because F it's under requesting F tree removal or pruning, but it also includes the hardship yeah. waiver section, yeah. so that could be yeah. appealed as well. And uh, maybe just saying can appeal, you know, may appeal a decision to remove or prune. You know, I, I'm just asking for that level of specificity, whichever are the things we actually want people to be able to appeal, not just like some to be clear what they can complain about. So, for example, when they say we have many, many trees on this driveway that you want us to remove and or that you want us to pay a large amount of money, which we have had that conversation already with particular climate, and then they say, say you know can that be appealed as opposed can the amount of money that you're charging us be appealed versus the actual removal or the pruning yeah no it does raise an interesting question because of the structure mm -hmm. yes. of the bylaw with uh, principal sections a through f since the appeal section is a um, under F, mm -hmm. does, is it limited to F? Uh, the implication as a matter of general statutory structuring would be yes, mm -hmm. it, that the appeal only would be applicable to um, something that arises under that subsection uh, request tree removal or pruning. And I'm not sure that's what was intended. Formatting error. Hmm? A formatting error. Well, it, it raises a question of whether uh, there should be some general mm -hmm. section, additional, uh, you know, even a, a G, which is uh, mm -hmm. general provisions or something like that, mm -hmm. that you then put. Uh, appeals and enforcement under mm -hmm. so that appeals and enforcement applies to the entire ah, right. bylaw right, and not right. uh, mm -hmm. not by implication to just a section of it right it's unclear, which makes it vulnerable to challenge and uh, I think that there are certain things that uh, uh, then become problematic because uh, without doing something more, it will create uh, the uh, need for standards that can be applied. You want to make sure that the standards are the standards that are in the regulation themselves, because that's what we are trying to do. And uh, uh, by just uh, giving the responsibility to a 13 person council. Uh, I think that they're almost going to have to, me, uh, the first time this comes up, visit the whole thing all over again and create a process that they would apply to this because they really don't have any guidance um, out of this as to how to apply it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, well, just I, I didn't read this until this afternoon, and then I felt really badly because it was like I can't really um, accept this without these clarifications mm -hmm. that we've been talking about. And I was like, I would have, if I had done my job earlier, I, I might have called the manager and said, you know, I, I think we need to do a little more work on this before we bring everyone mm -hmm. in because I. Um, so can I just sort of summarize what I, I heard? Yeah. Make sure we've captured everything. And um, so, so DBH and the first line. $500 should be $300. Um, just as a standard, the um, bylaw review committee is putting all definitions up front. That's how they, that's their standard. Um, that first paragraph, critical root zone, we're going to put a comma after diameter, lowercase a. Um, the 
PSTC, the APSTC committee should be PSTC, but you'd like that spelled out along with, with DBH. Um, Actually, just to go back yep. for a second, in that first paragraph, that also called the root projection zone could probably be a parenthetical phrase after the critical root zone CRZ. I and mean, that can move mm -hmm. all the way to the beginning. Or a minimum of six. So critical root zone print CRZ comma also called the root protection zone RPZ comma is a circle on the ground corresponding to the drip line of tree. Got it. I think where that's my understanding of what folks were thinking okay. about that. Okay. Just clean up. I don't have anything on the second page. Of course, this is not numbered uh, or third. But then we go to the last page, and the things I have there is um, some kind of uh, standard for hardship waiver. Uh, some research on that. Um, possibly pulling out appeals and enforcement as a separate section. Um, I'm re hearing that anyone can appeal a decision, but what decisions are we talking about? Um, and then verify that on the enforcement, the, the collect all fees and fines, where does that make sure that that's covered previously? But we might want to say it explicitly here. I, are there I, anything I missed? No. I, w I would suggest under the... Uh, any resident or interested party, I'd go with any resident. I think we should limit to residents. That would be my opinion. Okay. Because um, I think that's, you know, you're saying it's public resource mm -hmm. for the town. I think then those, t then if we're going to be broad enough to not Taxpayer. say, you know, the, what's well, that? Non resident taxpayers. There's that. No. That is, I don't care about the, the not taxpayer. <laughs> no, she, oh. he's, say, he's saying if you say resident, oh. then there are, if there are people who pay taxes oh, who here. Who own property but don't that, that It's not their primary residence. But residents. they aren't residents. That's why I know anyone sounded really loose, but I couldn't come um, up with anything right. else. Maybe it needs a little, maybe we can tie it to something. Or where you we can just use passive voice. Appeals may be. <laughs> <laughs> also, I would like it to be people over 18. So I, I really don't want a parade of young people. Just say adult. Yeah. Saying what? Adult. <laughs> So we have to sort of nuance that one. It could be it could be any resident or property owner. Mm -hmm. In the town. Foreign students. You know, age of majority. <laughs> yes. I don't want someone arguing that someone who lives here for three months is not a resident. Mm -hmm. I, it, it, right. It's just not worth it. Section. They are because there's no durational standard in the state allowed. So one day wow. you're a resident. Is somebody right. going to say there is? Uh, well, that's it. But they're going to lose. That's why I'm not. They're resident as soon as they have the lease or they pay an electric bill or whatever. Right. Yes. Um, so go, going back to um, number three, the appeal process. Again, that is relating to the decision. I believe is the intent that is decision by the tree warden to not remove a tree. Um, I don't know if we want to have the second one being the appeals process for permission to remove a tree and paying the fees uh, and the right. replacement costs. Um, I think the, the applicant would be the person who would be interested in an in appeal process who was denied permission. Um, I'm not sure if the average citizen would want to appeal uh, a no decision on a removal, but maybe they would. I'm not sure. Um, so do we want to have a, the second appeal process define based on Chapter 87's current definition of an appeal process. Um, if, we had a, if we could uh, reference state law, it'd be nice. Yeah. It, it just needs some research. We'll, we'll work on this. Mr. Wall. I just, maybe one question for the tree warden and then also a, uh, a comment. Do you have a sense of what kind of removal fees one is talking about? You know, it says one can appeal to waive or reduce the removal fee? So it's a replacement cost and right. it's based on the size of the tree, essentially right. the diameter of the tree. So it can range significantly. Um, it can... I mean, in your practical experience, do you have any numbers or is that just... You're, they're, it's not uncommon to be three to $6,000 okay. to $10,000 if they're, if, they're, if they're taking down significant trees in the broad right. way. Okay. So really no, because yeah, that's good. Because I, I, mean, I appreciate Ms. Kruger's question about that. On the other hand, again, my experience is with things like demolition. And, you know, the, so on the one hand, you want this sense of a metric, you know, not just I don't want to do this because nobody wants to pay money for anything right. if they can help it. Understood. But on the other hand, well, like, what are you going to do? Ask for their tax returns? You know, I'm putting three kids through college 
and taking care of my sick mother and I've got debt on my car, you know. Who decides? There, I don't think, yeah, I don't think there's anybody in any case in town I know of where people actually pro required to demonstrate in the sense of, you know, your college financial aid application or something, what your, what your financial status is. Our because you get into privacy rights there too. So I think that's why that's a lot comes down to the reasonable standard yeah. of the tree Although, warden. Mr. Wald, the CDBG program, I don't know if they're doing it now, but when they're, they were doing rehab loans, they would get waivers to see people's tax returns. There was a state requirement for a standard. So um, I'm not saying we have to do it that way, but there is a way to do that. And it's not just um, people claiming I have these expenses, but there, there is a kind of cut and dried way to get, if they want the benefit, they sign the release and there is a way to analyze it. And then your actual income is within the range that qualifies you for the hardship. But that's to, to what, to get? That was to get like a really low interest or deferred payment loan. Right, but I think that incurring a debt and borrowing from the public funds is different than saying I can't afford to cut down a tree. $20,000 in tree removal to relocate an unsafe driveway, I mean, it's yeah. overwhelming. Yeah, no, I'm just saying that I'm sure there'll be people who are concerned about privacy too, so it, it's an issue worth raising across the board, but I'm not aware of a standard so far applied in other parts of uh, appeals for for town bodies like this. Yeah, I do, I do have a, I guess, one thing to point out uh, for the sake of inviting for clarification. E, subsection E has um, four identified prohibited acts. The fees provision that's at the top of the regulations um, has proposed fees, we've raised the question about the $500 one for E1, E2 to E4 is $50. And um, are we intending that the appeal process cover those and uh, by having placed it under F, the implication is no, but then Where's the appeal process if somebody is unhappy with the fee? And did we, uh, it, it, was there a particular intent in your drafting to exclude uh, an appeal process for those violations? So under non-criminal disposition, there's a separate process that stands alone, and that would be outlined over, as an overarching thing. So non-criminal disposition, you can appeal, but to the court, not internally. So it's like basically writing a parking ticket, in essence. That's what the, the tree warden would do. So is oh. it our intent to leave it? I'm just, this is the question for the select board. Is our intent to leave it as Mr. Bachman just described it, which would then mean that we should actually leave the appeal section where it is? Um, I think it's a clarification that we needed. Further along those lines, aren't we glad we didn't do this back in August? Um, is we'd still need to know, though, even if we say that the appeals process doesn't apply to two through f this appeals process doesn't apply through two through four because it applies to the non-criminal disposition. You get a parking ticket. You don't. You well, parking tickets maybe not a great example, but you take it to court. Um, rather than that you take it back to the tree warden. You know, you burned a tree, that goes a different path than going back to the tree warden and then select board slash council. But that doesn't address the issue of whether or not appeals associated with waivers can be dealt with. And so that still needs somehow, whether it's layout or, you know, format, we need to figure out if people can appeal that because otherwise the way you've got it set up it looks like you can appeal hardship waivers and you know if somebody makes one and then they're told no appeal then they can that. appeal yeah, that seems, yeah. and so maybe we want to maybe we don't but we need to be cl right. we might think we know what it means today right <laughs> but what it means to other people six months from now is perhaps not entirely clear <coughs> partly because of that and then speaking of appeals if we are talking about the appeals process that is in MGL 87 section four, which of course, as so many sections of MGL, has absolutely nothing to do with towns that will have our form of government, it says, cutting down or removing public shade trees, approval of selectmen or mayor. So we can see we don't fit. But 
it says, if at or before a public hearing as provided in previous section, objection in writing is made by one or more persons. That's it. Doesn't say it has to be somebody who lives in town, somebody who's 18, somebody who's nearby. It says one or more persons, and that is exactly the argument we have had where the tree warden has decided the tree warden totally appropriately, of course, according to the select board, wanted to cut down some trees, and one person said, no, you cannot cut down those trees. That was the appeal that was happening, and we had to have that hearing under this provision. So if that provision still applies to our new form of government, because they don't seem to give us an alternative, um, then I don't understand why we would alter that, given that I don't believe our bylaw gave us some authority, right. which would have been checked by the AGO and all that, so to be can't. different than I don't, I don't see why we could limit it when the, it appears, uh, right. not an attorney, but it appears that the MGL 87 section 4 says who, which is by one or more persons. So we may be stuck with that. We can't be more limiting than that. So maybe we just adopt that language mm -hmm. and just stick it in there and be done with One it. So more say, that's what the law says. Yep. Right. Okay. But I think articulating what is or isn't appealable, sort of what that applies to, is, mm -hmm. is important there. Yes. Again, that's for the rem when someone requests to remove a tree and the permission is granted, the appeal process would be for one or more persons, like you just read. Um, but the other appeal in section, uh, sorry, three here, um, that appeal again is just for an appeal to somebody who was told no, they can't cut a tree down. Right, but that's, it's not explicit enough, I think, because it just says these decisions and it, uh, we should be explicit about what they are appealing. Yeah. yeah. I think that's right. Which two? So it sounds like we have two, and actually three, if you count the hardship waivers, three different kinds of decisions that in theory could be appealed, but maybe we don't want to allow for the hardship decisions right. to be appealed. Um, so this is my last one. So now that I've looked at it a bunch, on the prohibited acts where we have the $300 for one and the $50 for two, three, and four, I am wondering, number four, cause or encourage any fire or burning near or around any public shade tree should that be $50 or $300? That seems pretty dire. Or if you have the fire near, but then you damage the tree and it triggers one, and then you get the $300. So I, I know in Chapter 87, um, the 50 is for non-criminal. Um, 300 would be for a criminal intent, was my understanding of Chapter 87. 300 is still non-criminal. Both non-criminal. Mm -hmm. You don't have criminal power here. Non-criminal disposition. Your E1 and, and E2 through 4 at the header part. Correct. Anyone so else think 50 is too cheap for putting a fire code. under a shade tree? That would apply, but anyway, yes. So they are, to be, to be clear amongst all of us, all these are non-criminal dispositions. There are no criminal dispositions associated with them. And then the other question I have, and I don't know the answer to it, and I don't know if it indeed needs to be answered, because we, I know, talked at length, and Mr. Snow explained to us in great detail where we wanted to measure the tree in terms of height and then diameter. The note I had before that I was confused about, I realized in the new section, is uh, under item F, requesting tree removal or pruning, item one, and it refers to a size of five inches dbh which i am not seeing in mass general law so i'm either i'm missing it which is entirely possible or it's something that we are choosing to do because we think it's a better choice which i am also fine with but i'm just trying to be clear that that was intentional as opposed to the 300 and 500 confusion that we've been having it was, so but it was intentional um and that's in relation to the the replacement cost so any tree over an inch and a half um, is a public shade tree, right. but if it's five inches and above, that's where the replacement cost would enter. So just, we skipped over the burning the tree, the fire under the tree issue. Right. I think the determinant, the, the estimate on that was 
um, one, the number one, which is the higher cost or the higher fine is where you actually are destroying, is kill or destroy any public trade tree. Whereas you could have a fire near a shade tree, it doesn't kill it, but you don't want to be constricted to having a $300 fine on that. The, the other, you know, Adams two, three, and four are more endangering a shade, a shade tree versus killing it. But if you had the fire and then it did kill it, then you're in then one. You're in one, right, if you kill it, yeah. It, it doesn't say by me how you kill the tree. <laughs> <laughs> We're not splitting those hairs. No. So now when everyone writes to the newspaper and says, those tree huggers, we know. <laughs> we deserve this reputation. Was it five inches or greater at UBH? <laughs> um, or not. So, I, so we'll work on this and bring it back to you at a future yeah. meeting. So breast height could vary quite a bit. Well, that's why they define it at, what is it, four and a half feet? Four and a half feet. Oh, yeah. Okay, anyway, yeah, that was a I missed point. that, yeah, I mean, I remember. Depends on who's who, but uh, so we'll take this up, hopefully soon, but mm -hmm. we'll just tidy up again from, or we'll do it again. each time we do it, we kind of, yeah. it's, again, the intent is really not works. changing, it's just sort of those nuanced pieces that we run up against when we try to really make it enforceable and, and uh, a living document that, you know, regardless of who reads it and when they read it, it's, it's functional for them, so I, tidy it up. I appreciate that, and as I said in our earlier um, meeting, um, when we started this process, that's exactly why I wanted to bring it to you, because you see all these things, um, and it's really important. It'll make my job easier if it's very clear, and uh, we know exactly what we're supposed to do. So that's I really appreciate your you effort. That's a good how point. Yeah. This apart <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So moving on in our agenda to uh, 4C, to go back to 4C, uh, which is Select Board Budget Policy Guideline Process. Did I miss do one? the appointment. I do number five. What? Just because. Oh, 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 I didn't realize that. Oh. Or I, we could have done that ages ago. I didn't yes. realize someone was waiting. So since we're skipping around, we'll go to five on confirmation of appointment of Shoshana King to Public <laughs> Arts Commission. I'm sorry I didn't realize you were here or we would have done this. Hour, not hours also ago. You're, you're sitting with the tree people. With <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. I right. hang out with them too. <laughs> <laughs> she, yeah, she's on both. <laughs> right. So, um, thank you for being willing to serve on the Public Arts Commission. I didn't know if, if Mr. Bachman or uh, wanted to, you know, offer any comment or introduction to this at all. Sure. Or? So the Public Art Commission is. Um, uh, below the required numbers it's, uh, under the new charter. Uh, if there are no appointments that can be made unless they are below a quorum plus one, public art commission is below a quorum plus one. Um, we had one applicant, Mr. Wald and I interviewed her and, and uh, Mr. Brody, who's the chair of the public art commission. And it was Mr. Wald for his, if he had anything he wants to add to that. No, just that I know that also Ms. King has been attending meetings regularly and is very up to date on all the activities of the, of the commission and is really eager to get going. So we're happy to make this appointment and to give you the opportunity to serve officially, finally. Thank you. That's it? <laughs> That's, we, do, we do have to do a motion. I didn't know if you wanted to make it, do you want to make a statement relative to this or, or you're welcome to, but you don't um, have to. I'm excited to uh, serve my community. Great. Thank you. I did have a question just for Mr. Wald. I did, uh, when I was looking at this, I saw there were two other people who had applied within the past year. Was inquiry made to them as to whether they remained interested? Um, Ms. Mills had actually started to schedule appointments and one of the people withdrew, so. Yeah, yeah so, so we did and, and others weren't interested in interviewing at the time. So this, mm -hmm. yeah. We had three. We actually had two scheduled and one person dropped out. Correct. Okay, thank you. So I would entertain a motion if someone would be so kind. I move to confirm the appointment of Shoshana King to the Public Arts Commission for a term uh, expiring on June 30th, 2019. And should we ex explain mm -hmm. by way of... So this is, again, because of the charter. We're making these one-year appointments, and then the new council will take up further appointments and renewals and so forth. Second. So we have a motion and a second. In the, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that's unanimous. Again, thank you very much for offering to serve. Thank you. And, and on the Shade Tree Committee, too, for okay. your volunteering to go <laughs> to those meetings. Right. 
Have a good afternoon. Sorry to make you wait. <laughs> so now. now that all the attendees have <laughs> been accommodated, I, didn't, I really would have done that sooner. I, well, I didn't realize. Here, she was here with the shade tree. She was here okay. with the shade tree also. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So we'll go back to select board budget policy guideline process. And so I believe in our packet we have uh, our guidelines from last year. Mm -hmm. Just as a frame for a conversation, we had a little bit of that conversation last time, and I'm sure we'll have uh, a robust conversation about how we might want to approach this topic um, for the coming year, given the change in government. If I can just find it. <laughs> I can see it. Electrical boxes. Buried it too soon. Um, it's, under there. it's under here. I buried it. There's the budget. Sports section. Okay. And delivery. What was that about a paperless office and everything? Can you move? Ah, there they are. Okay. Now I found them. So, <clears throat> in years past, we have taken a, a, a more hands-on approach because we had that role and responsibility to, to lay out budget policy guidelines uh, to the manager for the coming year. And, and I think you know, we sit in, a, as is the case a lot of times, we sit in a sort of strange place relative to a change in charter. And we won't continue to have that responsibility after December. Um, but nonetheless, uh, do and how do we want to offer advice uh, both to uh, the manager and potentially the council as to how they should uh, proceed with the budget? I think there are some things under overall philosophy and key concerns. Um, a lot of those are going to be, you know, the same as I was reading through this, you know, OPEB is still going to be a concern. Um, how we manage our debt, how we you know, use our uh, resources, how we uh, interact with the three institutions of higher learning. So, you know, some of those kind of things I think are, are completely fine to reiterate publicly and, and, and offer again as, as comment uh, on the budget process. But anyway, I'm open to so hearing I what people think. Absolutely. And my suggestion is this. So we talked, when we talked about this, we talked about, you know, well, okay, what's the purpose of the four boards meeting given where we are differently? And we all agree that that's a terrific educational benefit to the entire community. Um, and well, will the finance committee be doing guidelines? And if they are, then well, we want our shot at it too. At the same time, I wonder, one approach might be the following. That approach might include saying, Here's the old document, not dissimilar to what we did with the town manager goals, that say, here's the old document, and here are the four things that Ms. Brewer is concerned about, and I'm betting there might be some others, that others are concerned about, that you, sh that you could be thinking about moving forward, rather than trying to rework each one of these paragraphs and say, well, should we tweak that one a little bit to talk about <coughs> this, that, or the other thing? And so I will give you an example of my four concerns that I think are not addressed fully necessarily and some of them actually probably were addressed in the finance committee book for town meeting but are not going to be clear to are not clear to us necessarily say if we were just sitting here in a normal year we don't necessarily know the answers to these questions until the town manager says well that was on page 53 of the finance committee book or the big binder and so therefore it's not going to be useful to the council moving forward either so for example on page two under item m it says this budget will be constructed without knowing whether the town will have chosen new. So rather than having to rework that, the second part of that says any increases in expenses for the implementation of a new form of government should be identified. So there's election cost uh, was one that was identified as a possibility, but the cost that we just talked about earlier tonight could be mentioned in a, te in a paragraph or, you know, or referenced to a document. That's what those costs turned out to be rather than trying to rework this paragraph. The one just after that, because I did say I had four, on the, I, the next item is actually directly below that, which is item N. When we wrote this back in December, 
we said several town meeting actions in the past year will have negative implications for the creation of the budget for FY19. So what was the upshot of that, I think, is going to be important for people to recognize moving into the next budget cycle. I'm not sure, and either we should figure that out now or we should just say, you all should look at that as, you're, as the budget is being developed because we need to be able to, we can probably come up with it off the top of our heads tonight, but it needs to be attributed somewhere. And similarly on page three, um, there's an extraneous and in mm -hmm. the first in, in item B, which I know is critically important <coughs> to all of us. But um, under item four, other new revenue, the other two that I wanted to bring to our attention is item C, service fees need regular evaluation to assure they are in line with costs. This has traditionally not been one of our strong suits in terms of where, when we can report to people, well, the last time we looked at the things in the planning department was such and such year, and we changed three things, and we left all the rest the same, because we all know that we can't just jack up the price to whatever we want it to be. It has to be associated with the services. Um, but to say, you know, we're on schedule to examine the fees in the clerk's office this year, and two years ago we did the ones in the planning department. I think would be valuable to people because this is the kind of thing people always say, well, have we done all that? And it's like, well, we evaluate it periodically and we don't ever seem to have a report as to what we've actually changed um, that we can really explain to the public. And similarly, item E is when grants involve funding of individual personnel, we need a clearly community st communicated strategy for whether those positions will be continued. And we do have a waste reduction position, for example, that's partially grant funded that needs to be accounted for moving forward, which I know obviously staff is doing, but I'm talking about understanding you know, you know, where choices will eventually have to be made associated with that, just like in the past we've had to do with firefighter grants or with, with police grants or, um, or other grants, like when we've used block grant money, for example, for various people's positions. So those are just the kinds of things that people get confused about, I think, going forward. And since you're going to have a new set of people who are not going to know all those, I guarantee they don't know those things now, um, to be able to think about a way to express some of those things as the entire budget unfolds. I'm not saying they need to know it the first day they walk in. But the rest of these things, to me, and I'm sure some others have pulled out some other things, do feel very much like a continuous sort of focus thing that doesn't necessarily need to be particularly updated for this year. Thank you. Ms. Um, there, there was another one that I, um, I'll get to in a minute. So actually, um, I, I um, don't agree with taking the same approach that we used in the um, manager goals. I, I think, maybe because I marked this up a lot today, I think this could easily be updated. Um, I think most of it's the same. There's a couple things that are just aren't relevant or out of date. One, um, Ms. Brewer hit on. The other one was um, the rising cost of health care and the health insurance trust fund resiliency, which is uh, G, 1G, and it goes to the second top of the second page. That's a different situation that also would need to be updated along with um, the one about um, the town will have chosen a new form of government, which is M, as Brewer mentioned, that one maybe by just keeping the second sentence, that's the update. Um, so I think most of this is still, could be repeated as the um, FY20 guidelines with a couple of updates or corrections. What I, what I did when I read it, um, this was really in the weeds, but, some places we say we and are, and other times we use, we step back and the, the tone or the structure is more formal. So, you know, at the beginning, one, A, B, C, it's like overall physical sustainability, growth and state, and then you get to E and it goes, we support maintaining a level services. So we, the voice alternates between a statement and then a sort of sentiment or a position. And I tried to mark this up, I tried to um, take all the <coughs> we's and R's out that I possibly could to make it consistent in voice um, throughout. So that's something, it's more in format. We've already talked about um, a couple of the updates and I, and I did a couple of other. Um, like the third page, three, economic development, B, it says, 
growing our property tax base, because they're growing the property tax base. And again, I tried to make that consistent. Um, so I, and I mean, I could be convinced otherwise, I would um, opt for, you know, turning in our, our changes and, and maybe just giving this a brush up and using it as the FY20 um, budget policy guidelines. I, I don't support the thing of like, here's the four things we updated and here's the one from last year. I think that that's not as useful, but others might disagree. I follow up on one particular item. So I, I freely admit that many chairs over many years have cobbled this together from things that we've said and so the voice does change because it expressed the sentiment more than that we were concerned about. And I actually like the we statements because they seem more user friendly, but I get that that is not everyone's style. However, given that, um, we have facts like item C. Uh, okay, we're just on the first page. Yeah. Item 1C, Amherst relies very heavily on, on residential property taxes as well as on new growth to fund town services. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's in some ways just like, well, yeah, we all know that. So that's really not, that is part of a philosophy. Is it a concern? It, I don't know what it actually is. I mean, we've done our best <clears throat> with this over the years. But given that sort of statement, then how do you change, since you had indicated that you marked this up, how do you change E when you're talking about we welcome a short and prioritized list because that's saying we, the select board, want to see that short and prioritized list. So how did you change that? A short and prioritized list with rationale for budget additions should funds become available. Um, Those where? Well, I, I just circled the two we's, but I haven't rewritten that particular one. So my point being, short I'm not saying you, it, it should be developed. For whom? That's my point. That That's one of the reasons we end up saying it this way, is we welcome a short and prioritized list because we want it back if funds become available. If you're just going to say create a list, it's like for who to it's do direct, what? So in, it, in, the past, in the past, it has been that statement is a directive to the manager. Right. Yes, yes, exactly. Right. <coughs> Whereas. This is more a message to the future. future right. Body. In, in creating a new version of this, and we're trying to modify the voice of it, it, it has that kind of directive we can't. Who gives the list to who? Right, exactly. That's what yeah. I'm asking right. you. Right, no, exactly. Because if, there, because if it's not specific, then why do it is well, part of what I'm asking. I mean, like, this, th these are things smart people do daily as part of their job. And so if we're saying what we want out of it is a short and prioritized list, if, they're, if, if we don't want anything, if we don't think the council should get anything, if we think people should just do their jobs because we reminded them that Amherst relies very heavily on residential property taxes, I'm, so I'm not really clear. I, really, if you follow that, this is from the select board to the manager, it would mm -hmm. be the, the it implied the manager should provide a short and right. prioritized list for right. with rationales for budget additions should mm -hmm. funds become available, which, which usually we have. Like, if funds become available, I want to add another um, I won't right. say one of our favorites, another trash collector or whatever. Um, so I think this is, for me, more grammatical. Who cares about we welcome? The welcoming is not, it doesn't seem to me to belong in here. It's a directive of if more money is found, these are the first things you're going to find. And we've used that. It's happened. And the manager then says, well, I had identified that as my next priority. Should I be able to afford it? And then we kind of know that that's been signaled and it's been funded on time, from time to time. Right. And the, the other thing is I think in, in there are probably several places in here where we could um, it's not necessary to write it in a directive manner because it's, he isn't reporting to us at that point in time. Um, and so it, it would be things like it's advisable that the manager create a list <laughs> for, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's partly to, you know, sort of frame it uh, for the council to consider as much as it is for the manager to consider. So I don't know if that's, but, it's, but that sort of begs the question. I mean, that's, I think, why you suggested what you did, which is here's what we did in the past. And here's some things amongst those that are still issues of concern that you're going to need to contend with. Um, and so, you know, it sort of absolves us of trying to nuance those kinds of <laughs> directives versus not is the idea there. So, 
correct all the grammar should be <laughs> item one. <laughs> right. Put it all in the same yeah. voice. So, Mr. Steinberg. Yeah, I, I'm not, I raise a question preliminarily um, after looking at the charter again as to whether we ought to be issuing these guidelines at all. Um, and I know it's ready to, uh, we talked about that. I know we talked, here. I know we talked about it, but, you want to uh, talk when about you it? look at, when you look at the, when you look at the charter, the charter indicates that the process essentially begins much later right. and not later than March 15th, excuse me, uh, that the town manager, um, uh, uh, town manager should submit at least, um, call at least one public forum on the topic of the proposed budget. The forum is intended for the town council and the manager to present priorities, context based on prior year's budgets, revenue and expenditure forecasts and other relevant information, and to solicit feedback from the public. Um, there's really nothing in the calendar that's earlier than that in the budget process um, the going four, forward. What's the four boards and, then? Um, I think what we're trying to do is to get um, a process moving, but uh, the question isn't the four, isn't the presentation of the information and the creation of the information about the, ta the, the town finances. I think that's always valuable to do. And it's always valuable to give that context um, to the schools and to the library so that they can begin work on their budgets. But these at most are suggestions to the council about criteria that they might want to consider um, because they uh, as a council have March as the timeline to give to the uh, manager and this January budget, this is all written around a January budget that the town manager had to provide to the select board and the finance committee under the now um, former town government act uh, in the new procedure is a later date um, than March 15th so we're done. to provide <laughs> the uh, budget altogether. So I, I think we need to be, uh, I know I wasn't here, I'm sorry about that, but um, you need to be thoughtful about why we're doing this. We weren't unthoughtful. Which we were when you weren't here. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that came up was, as we said, the four boards meeting. Another thing that came up was, I believe I phrased it indelicately as, who's gonna tell the finance committee it's not their job to give out finance committee guidelines this year, because it's not, based on what you just read, not that particular section, but the whole theme of the transition period, I don't see that it's the finance committee's job at all to be putting out guidelines this year. That's separate from the four boards meeting, except they usually meet right literally right after the four boards meeting to start doing that. But I don't think it's entirely appropriate for them to do that, but I'm not in charge of them. And so if they're going to still do that, then the question was, let's pull this out and see if it's something we want to do. One possible thing was my suggestion. Ms. Kruger had another suggestion of a different way to do it. I think no matter how we look at it, given the timing exactly that you mentioned, and in light of the Finance Committee's independent actions, that in light of the fact that the town manager said he's still going to start working on the budget, basically in this traditional time frame, even though the charter requires later time frame, luckily, is that then this perhaps given all those things, becomes more of part of these mythical, not yet existent guidelines for the future town council, as opposed to being our substantial directive to the town manager for the department head meetings he's having now and soon about budgets, even though he's not required to issue a budget in January like he used to be. He had given us, I had walked away with the impression that he would still be interested if we had something particular to say about that given that he was still going to be starting those meetings he wasn't going to wait until after the council was seated to start working on the budget 
So given that and given the talk we keep having about giving direction, offering our pearls of wisdom to the future town council, that that is more what this document is rather than their traditional, we need to get this done so that he can have the department head meeting so that then he can do the budget in January and everything falls into place that way. So it's off cycle, but is it a thing we can use because we don't yet have any things we can use to give to the council as something that's more advice yeah. than it is directive. Right. And I think that, you know, I'm resisting the urge to say we should just write a memo that says, you know, good luck, spend wisely. Um, <laughs> but, Signed by all of us in really big. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, but I think the notion of it, it, what's sort of coming to my mind relative to, the, to your comments is that perhaps uh, in thinking about you know sort of a document coming to the you know from us to the council as advice or here's things you know there's a section on you know financial um, uh, policy and guidelines and and you know in the order of this sort of thing in much the same way we might write a section relative to evaluation of the manager um, so those could be separate memos on different topics or they could be one monster memo with multiple sections but right. reserve fund should not be used to support recurring expenses that's like one of our faves right yeah absolutely and we'll we'll pass that advice along whether formally or informally i'm sure mr wall do you have something you want oh, to i just wondered if the ma manager had an opinion as to what, yeah. what you'd like us to tell Please. you to do yeah, we'll <laughs> tear it up. i think we we did talk about this last time and it wouldn't it doesn't hurt to have this document out there um we are following uh, an earlier a regular schedule for a lot of reasons, internal staffing plus the schools need their number. Um, and n some concern about whether the, when the council will have their ability to sort of focus on it. So I think having the document, I mean, I, all things, uh, this document survives year to year. It doesn't take a whole lot to, you know, we, we would just wrap up this whole document. But if you said it, we'd like to update it and clean it up for the next fiscal year that's that's doable um, just I just want to make two points that Ms. Brewer brought up one about um, evaluating service fees we do look at service fees every year part of the budget process with department heads is to go through the service fees and we don't do a thorough analysis and, and, and a cost analysis of um, are this are they in line with all the other communities but we always go through the all the fees and revenue collected by every department and in terms of the position that you mentioned, in terms of grant funded position, that position was funded specifically as a two year position and nothing beyond that. And if the department de deems it to be a, a high need, they'll present that in their budget process, but it's not, it was advertised and um, hired as a two year position, as a grant funded two year position. So we were cognizant of that um, for the position that you mentioned. Was implied. Yeah. <coughs> Mr. Summer. As far as the Finance Committee guidelines are concerned, under the new um, charter provision, in future years, there'll be a budget coordinating group as structured according to the provisions in the charter, which has some similarities, but not entirely. And it will receive the budget projections and it's, pres it's presumed in the way that it is written, I think fairly clear, that it's the one that's going to provide guidance to the um, schools and to the library about how much money they should assume for the bottom line as they develop their budgets to submit back into the process um, according to the timeline established by the charter. Uh, and I think that what um, is kind of lacking this year is that that process isn't in place. And so what is to happen to give that guidance? And I think that was the purpose of probably having the Finance Committee come forward with guidelines. And it's, uh, but, um, you know, because I can't fathom any other purpose. Um, as far as our guidelines, I think Mr. Slaughter has actually stated it well because they're um, statements that really we're putting forward to share our expertise as you indicated 
and that uh, the uh, council will take that as appropriate, but that really falls into the March process that I described earlier. Ms. Kruger. Um, I think we did refer to that in our discussion and somewhat aware of that. I, I think um, it is an exceptional year. It's running in a different track. We may have feelings about we think what we think the current finance committee should or shouldn't do, but I really think that's separate from whether we want to do this and how we want to do it. So I, w I would like to um, separate those two issues. So I don't think this should be a response to they might do something and therefore we want to do this. I think we think this is valuable and we want to do it and how we want to do it is our decision. And I'd like to just separate it from that. What, what they may or may not do, which they we're not we don't appoint them, um, they're not under our purview, and we might have opinions based on our different understandings of the charter or what we think their role is. But I think we should focus on what our role should be. So I think moving ahead, you know, um, really the question is sort of you know how do we want to frame this up and and. I think that you know this document as it as it stands from last year is is a valuable resource certainly so it, it could be you know part of what we give to uh, the council's advice as far as hey here's how we frame things up this might be a valuable tool to you as well um, or you may want to take us you know they'll take a slightly different uh, m you know approach to it but I do think um, I'd love to hear how people think about whether we should write like a memo relative mm -hmm. to finance related stuff specifically, um, you know, or not. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm of, of a mindset that, you know, there could be a, either a component of a larger memo, or like I said before, or a, or a standalone memo, memo relative to budget and, and, you know, guidelines and, suggestions for how to work with the manager in that process. Um, you know, I don't know if that's how we as a board want to do that or, or not. Yes. I think all of these alternatives are good. I mean, there's no right answer. There's no perfect answer to, to the best way to do it. I think we're just trying to figure out what's going to be the most helpful and the least amount of work for us. <laughs> because the reality is we, and I, I just can't emphasize this enough, we haven't done anything yet. Right. that we are giving to the council right. and we're changing this over on December 2nd and so in light of not letting the assumption that somebody's suddenly going to develop an extra 40 hours in their week to write all these things up if somebody wants to volunteer to write a cover memo or if somebody wants to volunteer to write a chapter about a thing that's awesome but at this time, what I'm just, I mainly wanted to not have us not do is to say the council should somehow magically know that a year ago the select board wrote FY19 budget policy guidelines and that, or place that burden on the town manager to say, I don't know if you care, but here's the, what the select board wrote a year ago. So for, I don't really care how we do it, except I'm just really worried that we're not doing any things yet. And so if this is our first thing and we just say, we have a new colored folder that this goes in and look, it's our first thing, there's your thing. Mm -hmm. And maybe we just keep putting things in it and then as the things accumulate, we say, oh, we need to write a memo that ties why these five things are in this folder. But I just really feel like too much of this is becoming, oh, we could do it this way, we could do it that way. And then like, it's all, we're all gonna be saying, so Mr. Slaughter, when did you spend 80 hours writing that book <laughs> for them? And, and that's unreasonable. You can't, we can't expect you to do that. And so, we just need to figure out a way, whether it's a folder, it's a MO. Could we take this as it exists, knowing it's some of it's out of date yep. and we don't mm -hmm. we don't love all and put it in the folder mm -hmm. with the idea that maybe two weeks before that transition <clears throat> under the direction of the chair, which could be to ask for help, right, there's some kind of cover memo that or letter that just says, here's what we've put in here and here's how we think it might be helpful and that's you know a framing tool and it could be short and this could be you know document number one 
and maybe the manager goals because we kind of did our part <coughs> the three month and then here's some other ones from before so that could be document number two if people right. agree right? right so we got two in the folder where's our folder we've got we two want done a purple, already purple folder <laughs> <laughs> I have several of those, but anyway. Gold trim. Because we can all imagine these really elaborate, really cool ways we could have done right, this. But, and yeah, they But they you're right. So, okay, so that refocuses us and it complies with, I think, Mr. Um, Steinberg's <clears throat> concern. But we start to accumulate something because we're not going to write chapter and chapter. It's not going to happen. Nice idea. And anyway, they would probably chuck it. Right. No, I think it, it yeah, I think the whatever we provide is, is something that. You want it to be a good reference document and wordy in the right places, but not necessarily just voluminous for the sake of being voluminous. You know, in other words, it has to have the detail at the sort of right places so that when they refer to back to it, it has what they need to know. Um, but lots of it will sit and collect dust and may never get read. But anyway, well, for me, that was helpful to, to sort of articulate that a little bit and kind of chew on that a little Painful bit. Painful, but helpful. It is. Uh, uh, and I knew it would be in some respects, but I, I did want to get some some of other people's ideas about how to kind of approach some of that. Yes. Could we literally bring that folder, like we're having our yellow <laughs> folders, with us from now on, yep. so that we can, even if we sometimes just want to write a note to ourselves right. and stick it in, it's like our sign folder, right? A folder that yes. we could start to uh, just put these things in, Absolutely. so that so you could feel better at night. I bet the clerk would like to maintain that folder for us. Maybe a video tape <laughs> with each of us talking about A video for five message, yes. That's right. Go down to Am Amherst Media yes. and for two you? minutes. I'm capsule. That's right. <laughs> Precisely. So what I have so far for the contents are updated town manager performance goals mm -hmm. and not updated budget policy <laughs> guidelines. Right. We just did the FY19. Right. Exactly. So I think I'll move us to the, to the next topic on our agenda, Please do. <laughs> which is, is uh, additional town meeting appropriation, PBT, route restoration. What I was hoping to discuss with you this evening about this was um, what routes, uh, what additions could be made to routes that were cut, what those would cost. Um, and so I had gotten a list of uh, what a, a list of you know addbacks that we could do, which totaled about eighty thousand uh, dollars, for which would have added them back in the intercession time frame, um, and uh, some ridership numbers. So we could you know because obviously we only have fifty three thousand dollars to work with. They're about eighty thousand dollars in cost. So I was going to sort of try to frame that up a little bit, but on Monday evening when I was going to work on that and then send it out to you all, I had received an email from PBTA saying. UMass Transit is not able to hire enough drivers, so they're going to they're going to actually make additional cuts just because they don't have bodies to drive the buses, and so some additional reductions in service are going to happen on top of what has already happened. And so I spoke with the uh, administrator of PVTA yesterday a little bit about it, and uh, was asking, you know, um, they're hopeful to be at a more full staffing level by the second semester. They're you know they they actually the, one of the great things about the UMass Transit is they actually train the drivers. They get them the CDL license that allows them to drive the buses. Um, and those classes take about six weeks to get through. Um, they've, uh, as a result of this shortage, and, and it's actually, um, it's a shortage kind of system-wide. Um, and I think other, other transportation uh, authorities in, in other parts of the state are struggling as well. Um, you know, one of the things that UMass has done is to boost the base pay. Um, uh, to, I believe it's $14 an hour is what they're going to pay as the starting salary. And then every semester you drive, I believe you get another quarter per hour raise, which is a pretty significant raise if you think about it. Um, but they are, um, quite frankly, shorthanded and they've been sort of patching together as best they can, uh, literally pulling people out of other work in, in their facility to do this. And they can't, you know, they've got people that maintain buses that can drive and have been covering some shifts and that sort of thing. So there's actually some additional reductions in service that are going to happen this fall. Um, so one of the questions I ask, because if that's the case and they're running less, then they potentially have a little uh, gain in the budget. 
and you know because they're not expending you know gasoline and those sorts of things to drive those those uh, those routes. And so the question I posed to the administrator is, well, with the savings from not running those routes in the fall, plus the money that we have, could we potentially you know restore? Once you get to full rider, uh, full drivership, I guess would be the best way to, you know, full uh, employment for the for the shifts. You know, would we maybe be able to cover completely the restorations of those of those routes that we were talking about? And it's not a complete restoration of those routes. It was, you know, adding on to um, uh, it, it. It you know, it was adding the evening routes that get cut off is primarily what what those addbacks would be. You know, some of the differentials in, in what they call headway, which is time between the cycles of the buses, those are a lot more complex and difficult to change because, you know, a driver runs one route and he runs another route. And so you relace those things together in such a way um, that that to, ch it, to change those headway times between uh, times at a stop is, is a much more complex process. But to add a, another one on the end of the of the day or a couple of you know cycles through the through the route at the end of the day is a much more clean sort of addition. And, and like I said, that added about eighty thousand dollars. We have a little over fifty thousand available, you know, to the manager for for restoration of routes. If the savings from the additional cuts that they're making could augment that, we might able might be able to get to a, a sort of fully restored or a more fully restored uh, system for the second semester of this year. However, they do have to look at whether or not that would create savings or not in some respects because there's additional training expense, there's additional driver expense. Um, you know, one of the big partners in this is UMass and whether, you know, if they're not, you know, getting the service that they were committed to paying for, are they going to pay, you know, are they obligated to pay the full amount if it's for service that's not being delivered. So there may or may not be, you know, sort of money available. Um, so they were going to check on that. Um, it's going to take a little bit. There is a meeting of the PBTA next Wednesday. Um, hopefully I'll have answers about some of those things. Certainly if I get answers relative to that question of whether there are sufficient savings or that savings in combination with ours might be able to do um, a more complete restoration of, of some evening routes and, and that sort of thing. I'll share that out with you guys as, as soon as I know it. Um, but um, so I, I'm really kind of disappointed that I have to come in and say we're actually going to have a, you know even further cuts. And again, it's not because of uh, money not being available, but about the resource of drivers not being available. Um, so they've been uh, you know very actively pursuing new drivers and trying to get more more folks to drive, but they're just not going to be in a place where they're going to have them in-house and trained fully until second semester. So that's the sort of status of, of where those things are at this moment. Um, but I want to make you aware of that. And, and like I said, if I, um, we will, however, though, it, you know, again, the process of sort of altering routes has a long lead time in advance. And so if we are going to, and to what extent we might do some route restoration, um, we'll need to be pretty firm about what we're doing around the middle of October. Um, because they, they run, and we have a meeting right in the middle of October, and so hopefully that timing will work out pretty nicely, but the manager will have to, you know, execute a contract with PVT for those services. So, um, again, it's, you know, it's advice to the manager from us, uh, which we have to do in a serial way as opposed to doing it where we express opinion to each other through, through email or that sort of thing. Um, but like I said, as soon as I have more information, I'll share that with, with all of you um, about what's possible. Um, in regard to that, um, I will say anecdotally that one of, uh, besides the economy being very good, which means other jobs are paying well and so students are making different choices about where they work and that sort of thing. Uh, one other thing that was mentioned, and again, it's anecdotal, I don't think they crunched the numbers on this, but you know, one of the things if you drive a bus, and especially if there's federal money involved, is that there is drug testing involved and with recreational marijuana being legal in the state. They think that that may be a factor as to why some are not choosing that as as an option. Don't know if that's real or not, but anecdotally they don't know. I mean, but that could be, you know, who knows what sort of numbers that influence. It could be one or two, it could be 10. I don't have any idea, but uh, it was an anecdotal sort of thing that they shared, which was interesting. But anyway, so that sort of is the story on, on that section of, of uh, route restoration at this moment. We're still 
sort of figuring it out, but I think there's possibility to do some. Um, exactly how much is going to be a little dependent upon, um, you know, what the current the current further reductions, you know, and how they impact the budget and 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 uh, what it'll take to to bring those back and and potentially add to the to the roots. So, uh, not the best of news there, but anyway. So. Anything you wanted to add on that or know about that? Um, any questions for anybody on that topic I'd, or concerns about that? Um, all right, so next item in our agenda is, the, is charter transition, and I, I think we kind of, in some ways, covered a little bit of that with our last conversation about the budget policy, because sure it's so. sort of, you know, kind of covering that. I didn't know if you had anything else you wanted to share with us that have, has come up or that you want no, to express to us. Just to note that Monday, the bylaw review committee will be here uh, with a not to show you their work, but to show you how they're approaching their work and um, s sort of looking at a broader context of, of how everything fits together and how it's going to be presented to the public. Um, we're really fortunate to have this committee of people who are, you know, former town administrator, former town council, who Mr. Ritchie, who does this for a living um, and uh, just highly organized. So I think you'll be pleased with, with their approach. And, Give them feedback if you think they're going the wrong route. We have somebody to offer yeah, Mr. Mr. Bachelman is going to be annoyed with me, and I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. So we talked about last time um, the events of the potential events of December second and being held in the afternoon, and we talked about all the various conflicts and holidays starting, et cetera, et cetera. And I know that strangely enough, just voting for a charter did not mean that we suddenly had additional staff members who had time to plan all these things. But I wondered if we'd made any progress or had in terms of anything we could report to people or have people start thinking about saving the date associated with that if we know where we might do it yet or if any no, of our partners have offered us their spaces or not yet okay but it's still a but theory. we need but we need to do it soon so people know yeah i get it because that brings us back to the point of you know we have in this beautiful tiny point type which i really appreciate that we use <laughs> so that we could actually fit it all in the page because it really is oh, one indeed. two three four five six seven meetings it's actually five realistically that we have left because i didn't even count one's the, the four board one's the four board one meeting. of those yeah. is the four board yeah. that's right exactly that's the 18th yes and so so should we make a note that where it says Monday, December 3rd, then in fact that might be That's not Sunday, it. December 2nd. Yeah, or, or Saturday. We may do but it Saturday. Because we, we, yeah. yeah. we can't do it after. <laughs> we swear people in. So that won't really quite work, will it? Right. Yes. But if we need to. Sunday yeah. afternoon is less of an issue. I'm sorry, if we are going to actually inaugurate people on the second, as we talked about in some rather glorious plans um, that we were just uh, theorizing about, that. It's, it's kind of like our tr transition <laughs> document. It's kind of in Sounds that same. Sounds like a good thing. It's, it's sort of uh, um, nebulous, I believe is yeah, the term. That we, <laughs> then we obviously, you know, we would do, if that happens on the second, because it has to happen before noon on the third, then if we do need to be planning on Saturday or a, you know, 10 minutes before the inauguration meeting, we should just sooner rather than later because mm -hmm. it's odd timing. So could we say that maybe at our next meeting, which will be Monday, that we'll have an update on this issue? Sure. Would that satisfy you? I know you want it now, but. No, I, I realize <laughs> that there's just so many hours in the day. Know, just, it's just, you know, if we run into somebody no, from a particular institution think, and say, so no, when are you giving no, us that space? No, we could we do that. We could help. No, I don't think he wants us to help that way. But um, <laughs> more will be revealed soon. Okay. So we will definitely discuss that at mm -hmm. agenda setting tomorrow. So yes. Um, is there anything else anyone wanted to offer or add relative to the charter transition? Look like I have a subject that's close to it, but uh, one of the things we wanted to do before we concluded our life as a select board was um, to approve all of the minutes that have accumulated. And um, our staff did produce drafts and sent them to me. I did one of them, 
And I said, I am going to go into a process where I am committing to do one a day to get them done. Then I got very sick <laughs> yeah. the day after I said that. <laughs> See, don't say that again. So, it really uh, as we know, uh, I was then literally um, out of commission to do anything for a period of almost a week. Um, I think that my request to all of you is that we actually change the process and divide up the minutes amongst ourselves so that each of us take responsibility for two or three sets. And um, because the purpose of going through it is to review the minutes and as they're drafted um, and hit upon the obvious um, errors or, or corrections that should be recommended and then get them back to the committee. I mean, it's not the final review. It's never been taken to be the final review, but it sort of gets rid of some of the things that um, like um, appearances of who's before the board and things like that. So I think that my request at this point has to be as a practical matter, if we're serious about the minutes of before transition, that we need to do something other than we've been doing, and I apologize for that, but I just think it's realistic. I'm certainly, you know, I think that's a fine idea, and if, if you are, I don't know how many sets that you have that have <laughs> accumulated. <laughs> so, so the, certainly, I think doling them out is fine. So the process is, you know, we get a draft, I review the draft, we send it to whoever, to the clerk, who then reviews it and sends them back. We format them up if there's any changes and then get them to here. We have about half a dozen that are ready to go to the clerk, which I've held off on sending. But if you want to, me to divide those up, that's certainly doable if people are wanting to take that task on. There was a whole group of them. I think there was maybe 10 or so sets that you had previously sent to me. You, you may have those in your, we have a list. We'll look at the list and see what's Yeah, there. no, I have them all accumulated in one point in my hard drive. Yep. Um, which doesn't do any good if they're not getting looked at and reviewed. That makes sense. And of course, because it's my assumption that if we don't get it done, which of course is not an option, but if we didn't get it done, they would just become the minutes without us having you approved minutes, them. Right. And that's just the way it would be, just like right now, if somebody asked for them, which of course no one will. And But in the meantime, any that you assign to me, I have to have a hard copy. I can't do it electronically. So you'll have to print something out for me because my brain just doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if you want to stick them in my yellow folder, right, for, uh, for Monday night, or put them in my packet for Monday, that'd be fine. But unfortunately, I, I don't have a good enough printer, and I can't do it alone. Does anybody have any favorite years? <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's randomize it. Yeah. Well, um, we should probably drawing. keep, you know. It, it should be a meeting you were at. So like if together. you see the person wasn't at that one. Yeah. But rather than okay. like, yeah. you know, every other, yeah. right? You should probably yeah, cluster no, them. We'll right. try and do that. Yeah. Okay. I, I can go over the list with Ms. Mills tomorrow. And uh, Good idea, Andy. Yeah, I, if uh, sure, the they're not easily findable elsewhere, they're easily findable by me now. And they're probably easily findable here too. Yeah. There's some, we, I think what we did is we have a list on what's outstanding um, what's in my court, what's in the clerk's court, and um, which ones have been approved already, and which ones have been posted on the website. So we sort of have these different check marks along the way for each set of, set of minutes. So, so we'll end up with something like this on our agenda with minutes? Mm -hmm. like Hopefully not. Microphone. Hopefully we'll do a few every week, but <laughs> right. there's, some out, there's a fair number outstanding. And we're, we're building every, some every night. Right. Right. All right. So I think we'll definitely uh, tackle that. Uh, by a divide and conquer method, okay. <laughs> if we can. So I believe now what's left here is, is uh, before we get into town manager reports, select board member reports is the consent, consent calendar under uh, section seven. Uh, so if, if anyone has any particular item within the consent calendar they want pulled out, or if they want to offer a motion for the whole thing, or yes. So I just, Talk fast and get it over with. Um, seven hour receptions. I, I'm not grasping why they suddenly need to start running seven hour receptions at the Fine Arts Center. Because to me, that sounds like what has traditionally been 
a beverage or two before you go into the show. A beverage or two when you have the pre-meeting with the artist. Then you're going to have an after-meeting with the artist, and you're keeping people out drinking at midnight after a show. I, I, I'm, I'm willing to sign off on these, but I'm starting to get a little uncomfortable with that level of hours. So I think the university is trying to get ahead of the curve because these are all for 2019. Sure. And they don't prob I'm guessing they don't know the exact hours because they just know they have the date and they're putting this win bracket of window from five to midnight saying, because it could be five, it could be eight, we're not sure, so let's just put a bracket on it. Could, could the minutes reflect that somehow, that, that that's what we're working under, that assumption, that, mm -hmm. it, that it's not that we're encouraging the future license commission to give out six-hour special licenses once or twice a week, every mm -hmm. week mm -hmm. in the spring? I think that would just make me feel better that like we're not, we're not setting a precedent, but we are trying to help them in terms of realistically getting their scheduling done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that they, we, we've actually asked them to expedite all of their requests to us just to get as much as many of the licensing done as early as possible, just to not have to whatever the license commission is doing, so right. they don't, they're not struggling with this. So if, yeah, but if we could just have our minutes yep. reflect something along those lines that we assume it's a window, but not that they're actually serving alcohol for seven hours straight. Those events that just seems unlikely, and 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 perhaps not, and perhaps untoward. Something along those lines. But were there any particular ones that anyone wanted to um, pull out for special attention? And if not, then um, a motion relative to the consent calendar would be perhaps advisable. Um, direction. And I appreciate the effort staff went to to make it clear that it was to midnight, not 12 p.m. and not mm -hmm. afternoon. Not that, was, that was difficult too. This is so much work. Oh, exactly. To, it's to get all these details. So. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking about doing something like uh, I moved to approve the consent calendar from the September 12, 2018 agenda as presented with the understanding that um, the hours as listed are preliminary and tentative because um, I, I actually Preliminary and tentative would probably be sufficient, unless you want to add something more for a reason. I, whatever makes it clear that we we really would not be fond of the idea of seven hours at a stretch, week after week like that, but not that they have to come back. So I'm I'm not expecting them to come back and say no. This one's four to six, and this one's five to eight, and uh, as Mr. Bachman referenced. But whatever makes that clear to everybody is fine with me. You want to nuance that some more, Mr. Steinberg? I don't care. And then, then I. Uh, we could add something to the effect that, again, move to approve the consent calendar for September 12, 2018 agenda as presented with the understanding that the hours as listed are preliminary and tentative and that the actual hours will be less than listed. I like that. Yes. <laughs> so if much, yes. For parents, watch the tape. <laughs> <laughs> That works. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that's unanimous. So I believe that takes us to the town manager report. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the first thing is um, 
one note that the um, today the UMass Board of Trustees uh, Committee on Administration and Finance met and voted to move forward on uh, they received a presentation on the request for inf interest that the, the, the university issued back in June of 2017. Um, at that point, the university received um, about 10 responses to that. Most of the responses were of the residential in nature, and the university uh, has reviewed them and has gone to the trustees to get permission uh, or guidance to move forward uh, on the next step, which would be to issue an RFP, a request for proposals, for two particular projects. The first is, um, is to replace the North Village apartments. Um, expected, it would be an expected phase in uh, at the existing location. This has been noted to us that this is a high priority for the university. The housing up there is, um, needs serious uh, intervention, and they would look for a developer who would come in and work on North Village apartments. Um, the second is undergraduate housing. Now, the university has completed a housing demand analysis, and which identified a need for up to 1,000 additional beds, mainly studio one and two bedroom apartment style units. Um, they voted today that to move down this path Using utilizing uh, the public-private partnership method for um, for financing this, the university will do an additional analysis and um, expects to have responses to the RFP by January of 2019. Um, the campus master plan, the U3 report, and the demand study all point to potential development in the southern part of campus along Mass Ave and is. It's probably obvious to everybody that this is the big parking lots where the visitor center is, and that's the that's the parcel that everybody points to. It's where uh, undergraduate students have said they prefer to be living at, near campus at that location. Um, it's an it's an area that has been underutilized by the university, and um, so this is where they would conceptually look to put a thousand units of student housing. Uh, they alerted us to us. They alerted this uh, meeting to us, uh, the fact that this meeting was taking place um, earlier this week, and they met this afternoon and voted it. And um, so that's all the information I have. There are no um, proposals for actual housing, heights, distances, anything like that. Um, th what they hope to do is to say, we need a thousand beds in this unit, in this area, thousand give or take. Um, we, there's some graduate student housing, the Lincoln Apartments, they may incorporate in, they may not. Um, we expressed our concern to them that we know and hope that when they do the RFP that they take into account the neighborhood that is always uh, impacted by development in this area. Uh, and also the impact on uh, downtown businesses, depending on what they include in the RFP, if they want to include commercial aspects or not. So. Um, there's, I think there's always been interest in having the university step up and take some more responsibility for housing students. They feel there's a demand. The other thing I think they feel is that this gives them some ability, swing space maybe, to renovate some of their other housing units. It gives them the capacity to, as people choose other um, you know, um, dormitory type buildings, they can then go into another dormitory and, and build on that. So. Um, that's the basic information I have on that. It's uh, important information. It's a big step forward. Uh, the fact that the trustees are supporting it, it's in line with what they have done at UMass Boston and UMass Dartmouth. And they, I think they're following the same path here. So if we could, since we knew this was going to be a big, exciting thing, right? And we've been waiting since a year ago to hear more about it. Um, 
just in terms of some of the things that we've talked about before associated with that, I really appreciate you mentioning both the downtown and the neighborhood because the neighbors have talked about that at the various other meetings we've had at UTAC and, and different other meetings and, and how that might impact them. And so I appreciate you bringing that to UMass's attention again. And then in terms of public-private partnership, you know, we've talked about this for decades in terms of uh, being able to actually do this. And the idea would be under a public-private partnership that we would receive tax revenue from the or I mean what's the basic when we tell people what this means and now that it seems like it could actually happen because it's happened at UMass Boston and UMass Dartmouth what does it mean to us other than more beds will be created it's not the same as when they built the North Apartments for example which was just an expansion of housing on campus um. I think we may have different opinions about what it okay. does for revenue, and Thank I think that's you. something that we will need to okay. work out in it. Um, we believe if it's private uh, enterprise doing something on campus that it, it should be taxable, but I think they, we will have to have that conversation with them. Thank you, because then it's not, there's not a bright line apparently we we believe there is but they may not agree that there's right. a bright line they, they have a different bright line <laughs> <laughs> there may be bright lines but different places <laughs> right any other questions relative to that, of that well i was just going to add in and just my you know sort of not up to speed but um from my my days on the Board of Assessors, I know that just the fact of it being on campus property by itself is not the determinant. So it, I'm sure those conversations will happen and right. the back and forth of all of that. It's clearly important to us to have it file out in our favor, meaning more revenue. But um, just the fact of the land um, isn't by itself, my understanding, the determinant. But if Mr. Burgess were still here, I'd put him on the spot. Mr. Yeah. And then yes. when they said they're, they're looking for responses to you know, the next stage and their analysis of January 2019, so if in theory they get a good response, and the, I believe you said January 2019 for response to RFP. Mm -hmm. So that's really just a few months away. And so when, they, when people respond, you know, what, were the, what was the impression the trustees were left with in terms of, so therefore that means that we might have 1,000 new beds you know, by 2020 or 2022 or? Yeah. So, so I'm actually, from my notes, I'm not clear whether the RFP goes out by January 2019 uh, or if it's, it's, so I just I need to clarify that. True, or, yeah. um, but I would say that um, of the responses that they received to the RFI, uh, the bulk of them were for residential that they, you know, they had put out a lot of different things that they were searching for, right. but uh, hotel kinds of things they put in the RFI. But the most of the interest was on residential, and that's what they responded to. That's where the market was. But did they give the trustees any impression today of, and then if we continue to get good responses on residential, we would then, the idea would be that the borrowing would happen in 2022 or 2020 or 2050. Or do we have I any know. idea? No, we don't. They met, don't. At, they met well, at 1.30 the this, one, one this afternoon. And they didn't and report. I, I, just heard, I just said, just text me when, when the yeah. meeting ends and if they voted yes or no. And mm. they voted yes. So it's unknown. And that's okay. It's, yeah. it's just, it, that's different than it's going to be a year from now. Yeah. I think there's a lot of planning because it's just a concept at this point saying we concept. want to put housing here and then there's a there's going to be a public process we want them to have it engage with us in a very public process and we've asked for that and um, they've heard us I think so other things um, this this weekend electrify Amherst is having their um, event which is that um, to paint some utility boxes downtown. So on Saturday, uh, all day, you can go and watch people uh, paint utility boxes. Um, the marijuana review, town review team, I don't know, remember the name we came up, we settled on, had its first meeting today to sort of um, scope out how it wants to move forward uh, in terms of the recreational marijuana recommendations that it's going to make. and. Kruger represented the board at that meeting, and it was a pretty efficient meeting and got
got some good things um, laid out. There are two public meetings scheduled um, for recreational marijuana, one on uh, September 26th at 6 p.m. at the hangar, and one on October 1, don't know, at, it hasn't the time, probably six, location to be determined for two, diff two recreational marijuana um, producers who have to have the required um, out public outreach meeting before they meet with the town review committee. So those are the two things coming up. The, um, just let you know, we, we've received bids for our property and casualty insurance, so we're reviewing those bids um, in hopes that we'll be saving the town uh, and schools money. Uh, this Friday, um, the first responders pic picnic, so our DPW police and fire, and along with University and Hadley, first responders are invited to a complimentary luncheon uh, in North Amherst and uh, sponsored by the chamber and a number of other sponsors as well, which we really appreciate. And it's their way of saying thanks to all the people who uh, are putting in extra effort and are the first ones on the scene of any kind of natural, natural or person-made disaster. Um, the bid block party is a week from tomorrow night, September 20th. Um, Berkshire Gas has, came in to us. I'm not sure if I reported this last time, but they, uh, on the day of the meeting last, uh, last week, they came in and basically said there's no expectation to um, provide relief from the moratorium for the foreseeable future. And they're going to be starting to, a ad campaign saying there's nothing we can do. We, don't, we need our pipeline or, or else we can't <coughs> expand our supply. And so there's clarity on that, but they don't have a backup plan. So that was pretty disappointing. Um, the um, going to have a cup of joe with the police chief at Share Coffee this Friday, September 14th from 7.30 to 9 a.m. And that's pretty much it for my report. If you have any questions. question about the um, community outreach meetings as we've known before th those are just something the companies are required to hold and we find out about them because up until having the marijuana review team we they they're required to meet certain state requirements but they haven't been particularly effective at communicating with the town that they're doing them and I know that was one of the things that was talked about in the guidelines for the marijuana review team and so are we now able to put a little more um, uh, influence on them to get that information out more to our community since we have a wonderful town calendar, for example, that they could themselves submit to, right? So it's not just that a staff member has to do it. They could submit just like so many organizations do to community events because it's not a posted meeting. But it's just one more thing, the way that people would see it because we all know people don't read legal notices. So. Right, and I think you know there is some influence. The economic development director, who's our lead on this, has been um, advising them to not do it on Friday at 5:30 before a three-day holiday weekend. That that's exactly at a location that nobody really knows how to get to, even though it's a public space. Yes. To have it in places where people know, uh, put it at. We felt like I think the committee felt like six o'clock generally was a decent time because. It could be. It would be after work, but if business people were around, they were still here. If you were on a board or committee, you could still attend and then st attend your board right. meeting. So, um, and trying to do it on a day of the week that was accessible to people. That's good. Thank you for yep. again mm -hmm. allowing staff to make that extra effort so that more community knows about it. Yeah. Any other questions for the manager? If not, uh, we're on to select board member reports, and I gave mine earlier relative to PBTA. That was the main thing I had as far as news and, and notes. Does anyone else have some things to offer relative to their liaison work or other? I don't know it's about the minutes, so I'm done. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. um, well, Mr. Bachman reported on the uh, marijuana proposal review group, whatever it's named, and we had a, you know, about a 40 minute meeting today to get going and Mr. Kravitz has distributed the proposals and members will go to as many of those um, outreach required outreach meetings as possible and if we can't we'll get that information from 
Mr. Kravitz, and also the applicants have to report on those meetings. So it was good, and I, the next task is to read the proposals and work together on some questions, because each applicant will also have an interview um, with that group, and then decisions, recommendations will be made to the manager. So we're in a pretty fast timeline of being done by early October. I don't remember if we picked an actual date, but our intent is to get this done. Uh, there were six proposals to look at, um, and so that was good to get going, kind of a defined chunk of work. Um, my other update member report is the downtown parking working group met this morning. They hadn't met during the month of August. Um, Ms. Brestrup, planning director, came and presented the three concept plans for the North Common that we talked about and discussed last time in a somewhat similar select board. There was a variety of opinion uh, in that group, not one consensus opinion. And um, I think some of what was said would be communicated back to the design firm, Weston and Sanson, saying, you know, take this from that one, take this from this other one. You know, nobody liked X. So I think um, some of it was similar to what was said here, but they did make that stop, uh, or that was, it was presented to the parking working group and that they were appreciative of that. And the other update is that um, there are, um, I think four proposals have come in for the parking consultant that will be helping to um, update the parking data study and make other recommendations on how to better manage our parking system. And I think there will be three staff members and two members of the downtown parking working group. Um, and that will be um, Christine uh, Gray Mullen, our chair, and our vice chair, um, Catherine Porter, will be the two um, representatives from Downtown Park and Work Group sitting with staff to review proposals and make a selection so that that can get underway um, as well. So I think that that's all. I mean, uh, definitely lots of meeting notices and scheduling coming in tomorrow. The Municipal Strategy Subcommittee, the CCC, is meeting first of the season and then the Campus Community Coalition is scheduled to meet next week on Yom Kippur. Um, so, but everything's starting and uh, sort of feel the pace of September. Right. That's all I have. You didn't have anything else besides the minutes? Anything from that side of the table I've reported on mine, did you have I was just going to mention that I appreciated the firefighters, um, including the community, in the 9-11 ceremony on Tuesday. We really appreciate their holding that and, and welcoming the public to it. It's, it's a small and brief ceremony, but it's always very meaningful to the people who, are, who attend. So thanks for sharing with us. Glad we could have some folks there to attend. I, I couldn't make it, but I know a couple of you did. I have a completely couple things just to follow up on another time. Trivia B, if we are, I doubt that we are up to this year, but hey, if people want to have a rah-rah on the way out, select board team, that's on October 25th, Thursday the 25th. Mm -hmm. um, that morning is the Chamber Legislative Breakfast, which I, many of us frequently attend. But in terms of a group thing, we had the group thing, sometimes we've done the Trivia B, so if people are thinking about that, that's the date. But the other group thing we do do and that the, the town takes care of for us is the Chamber A Plus Awards. So are, is that being, I assume someone will, will ask us. Sure we will. That's being arranged, because that, that first week of October is coming right up on yeah. us. So Ms. Brewer, when yes. you said maybe we'll do a, like a swan song team, does that include you? Because sometimes you get us all psyched up, but you don't want to be on it. <laughs> I did it for years. Uh, My role became irrelevant. cheerleader. No, irrelevant. So if you would be willing to be on it, I would consider it. But if not, don't get us all psyched up. Let's, let's, let's think about it, because they're going to start sending us emails pretty regularly till we say no. I think we could have some great costumes for... What does an outgoing... <laughs> Ghost of select board past. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sure we could be quite inventive. Um, so I think, however, for this evening, 
that we've gotten through our agenda, unless there's other member reports. So if there's nothing else, uh, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And we're adjourned at 929. And out early. Which seems so much later. Thank you, Amherst <laughs> Media. Because we